Sure, it's This Week in Science. It's This Week in Science. We're posting live, broadcasting live to the world. Justin, wake up. Are you ready? Uh-huh. I'm ready. Uh-huh. I, yeah, let's time do it. is over. Let's do a show. Let's do a show. With a science theme. Should we uh, go right to the disclaimer? Do it. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. When we are born, we are born into feeble bodies that can do very little about how and where we are in the world, dependent on parents for everything, only able to communicate through cries and smiles. Our first major obstacle to seeing the world around us is overcoming gravity, growing strong enough to have a look around. In time, we learn to hold our heads high, to crawl, then walk, then one day run. And this was as far as we had gotten for over a hundred thousand years. In the last hundred years, we have overcome many more obstacles. We have mastered flight, mass communication, launched countless satellites and probes, walked on the moon, gazed upon galaxies billions of light years away, and peered into the inner workings of matter itself. In the progress of humanity, it is easy to think that we are up and running. But the future may prove that we have not yet even begun to crawl. We have proven that our once feeble minds are capable of holding our heads much higher. And at least we can say is that we have grown enough to have a look around. And what better place to start learning to crawl than This Week in Science, coming up next. Good science to you, Kirsten and Blair. Good science to you, too, Justin. Blair, you're wearing a party hat. It's somebody's Uh, birthday. Happy birthday to you. you. Happy Happy birthday birthday to you. you. Happy birthday. Birthday, dear, dear Kirsten. Kirsten. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday, birthday to you. But we can't finish you. it. Back. No, no, don't finish it because it's me, me, all me, the words are me, 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 me. We have to. Please, it's not the to... first time we've ever infringed on some copyrights. No, no, Aww. I guess. We're... I guess I guess not. This is well. This is uh, what do you call it? It's a public. We, it's, that's one of those things that should it's just public be domain. I think. But it isn't. It's not. It's not. They, that's why you never hear it in a movie. Ah, but now we're talking about it, so it is. So um, we're it, we're discussing we're it. We're analyzing it. Yes, analyzing that's right. it, and now that now it, we can use it. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, that's, you guys. I will oh, uh, as your birthday present. Whatever <laughs> they bill us, I will pay. <laughs> It's like 10 cents or something. Cha-ching. No, no, it isn't. It's actually many tens of... Do not agree to this. <laughs> many tens of thousands of dollars that they really? request for this. Oh, yes, okay. yes, this is the most obscene thing. And what's funny is it kind of reminds me of what just took place in, in making it so that you couldn't have a patent over genes, right? We, we, this, this, the whole idea of patenting genes for for commercial use, it has been shut down. You cannot patent any portion of the human genome, which is a fantastic thing that um, I'm, I'm so glad that this is the le- current legal decision. Because it could mean if there was a specific treatment for a cancer that, say, only applied to uh, Irish, Italian, whatever the heck else I am, that happen to have this strange confluence of this gene, they could patent it and even though a similar treatment that wasn't patented specifically for me could be available for free, I would have to pay for it. It just becomes a ridiculous, insane, unending sort of a thing. 
Yeah, I mean, they're still going to be working on process patents. So, you know, mm -hmm. if they have a particular technique that they've developed to create a certain segment of DNA, so, right. uh, for example, the, the cDNA, the circular DNA that is, um, that is currently being discussed is patented by one particular company. And so mm -hmm. other companies that are trying to use it because it's a very effective method may end up having to license that technology and pay a whole bunch right. of money. And, and, and which in a sense, possibly is fine. I mean, yeah, it's, in it's a, sense a technique. It's a methodology. Right. Yeah. It's, if, it, if it's... Even the technique can... can that can even be tough in science to patent a technique. If you've created a device, and I, that's what I feel like patents are for. If you've invented a piece of machinery that's doing something specifically new, patent the machinery. Somebody else should be able to find another way of doing that without that particular machine, a workaround of some sort. But when it runs in terms of like the pro when you say simply the process, then you could be like, well, you know, um, extracting DNA somehow is, or, you know. Um, right. There, there are possibly better methods of doing stuff than what people are using yeah. currently, and so you improve on things, you patent right, it. Right, exactly. That's what exactly. the whole patent process is supposed right. to be about. That's when, it, that's when it really works. Like It's like AC and direct current. Uh, you know, you having those two compete against each other uh, really is what showed that they were, which one was more effective than the other. Um, right, but you can't patent AC or DC, but you can potentially patent the way in which the you know components are put together to, to deliver it. Well, although initially they were patented. Right, but the, you can't do that. That's just they sad. were originally. It's, it's, okay. It's, it's so a anyway, a, a quick thing about Happy Birthday, just out of interest, is that mm -hmm. it costs fifteen hundred dollars to use it in a film. But mm -hmm. there is a current class action suit going on, trying to claim that it is in the public domain, and whoever tried to uh, patent it copyright or, or, it. or copyright, copyright it. it, excuse me, um, that they were actually stealing it from another song. Oh, so they're trying to claim that it's in the yeah. public domain. So, so wait, who, who is the something. evil corporation? Who's the evil corporation that claims to uh, own it? Oh, I just had it. Let's see. It's uh, Corporation Evil. Well, no, I mean, it's just, that's such an insidious it's thing. To try to <laughs> Warner it. Chapel Music. Warner, Warner. Chapel Music. Yeah. Worst company in the history. Oh, come on. Come no, on. I'm sorry. This is not science. This is not science. Let's right. move along, everybody. Science. Thank you for the happy birthday. It was uh, awesome. There's dinosaurs on here. There's dinosaurs on there. Oh, of course wow. you have a dinosaur Perfect. birthday hat. But duh. <laughs> but duh. I love it. I love it. So science, we have a bunch of science stories. I've got a huge number queued up, and I don't know exactly which ones I'm going to get. Too, but we've got a bunch of mouse brains, bird brains. Um, I don't know if I'm going to do any people brains. I've got some earth stories. And, uh, you know, we'll see what else we can. Be. Oh, stem cells. Lots of stem cells. Lots stem of cells them. and urine. Ooh. <sighs> That's right. It's a potent combo. That's right. Stem cells and urine. Coming up soon in this conversation. Yeah. What do you have, Justin? I've got uh, the end of the world. Yay! I mean, but I mean, what? What? How was that? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, BPA. Uh, I got a maybe a, 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 a sex story. I'm not really sure. Physics, new physics blurb. Blurb on new physics news. Yeah. And Tesla's dream close to being realized. Mm. Gonna be a good one. Very awesome. Blair? So I have a couple uh, stories about animal identities, um, spiders and dolphins, what we learned about their own introspective capabilities and individualities. Pretty cool. And then I have the latest in citizen science on things like the Instagram. <laughs> All right. Instagram yeah. science. I like it. Mm -hmm. Social media science. All right, well, since it's my birthday, we're going to talk about bird brains. Woot. Huzzah! Huzzah! Birds are awesome. And if anyone ever calls you a bird brain, take it as a compliment. Definitely. So uh, this first story was actually sent to be sent to be sent to me by uh, Jess Mason. 
minion among the twist minions and the the story is published in nature as of yesterday some researchers took computed tomographic scans or CT scans uh, which are basically very fine resolution x-rays of uh, the bird brain but not really the bird brain they were looking at the brain case of fossils of birds like Archaeopteryx and what they found is that the brains of and, and not just Archaeopteryx but non-flighted completely non-flighted uh, dinosaur uh, avian dinosaurs so avian dinosaurs that had not yet taken to the skies to become real aves they found that the brains of the avian dinosaurs that branch of dinosaurs actually expanded and became I guess capable of taking care of, of, of dealing with flight before they actually got to the skies what? So, so the chicken and the egg problem brain before flight well if we're talking about chickens the chicken egg came first that's always <laughs> well, we're not we're not really talking about the chicken we're talking about but, which came first no. did bird did birds learn how to fly and did the brain respond to that did they start jumping out of trees and the brain was like oh i guess i better get bigger or was the brain getting bigger and were they getting more circuitry related to using limbs in a different way and then that enabled them to jump out of a tree and go, hey, look, hey, look, I'm flying. So, well, okay, that would so make sense is... because if you were flying without the brains to be able to handle it, you would die, right? You would think so. <clears throat> you would think so. I mean, so yeah, if you don't have... kind of co-be developing. I mean, it's, I, the picture I'm getting, which I, I'm sure is absolutely incorrect, hmm? <laughs> the picture I'm getting is... A, an avian dinosaur with no uh, with no wingy formations, just regular old dino limbs, getting the brain brain circuitry necessary for flight, and then beginning the evolutionary journey, which seems well, I guess that's not totally unreasonable. But but if you think of like Archaeopteryx, which wasn't fully which wasn't a flighted bird, we think mm -hmm. Archaeopteryx had feathers. You know, we're starting to get the morphology of mm -hmm. birds, but was not yet flighted, didn't fly. And maybe it was using its limbs to climb and jump from uh, branches in trees or from the Yeah, but could it be like branches? a flying squirrel or like a sort of like a, how a, a chicken can flap for a little bit and get off the, off the ground for a little bit? I mean, could this bearing circuitry be being trained by short bursts of flight-like ability or gliding ability. You know, that, to me, seems Possibly. much more reasonable. Yeah. But uh, they, they definitely... They were looking at uh, non-avian dinosaurs, like uh, bird-like oviraptorosaurs and troodontids. So these are not avian dinosaurs, but related dinosaurs. And they had larger brains relative to body size than Archaeopteryx. And so what they say here is that um, you have to consider how the different regions of the brain's brain changed relative to each other in order to gain insight into what factors drove brain evolution, as well as what developmental mechanisms facil facilitated those changes. And if Archaeopteryx had a flight-ready brain, which is almost certainly the case given its morphology, then so did at least some other non-avian dinosaurs. So mm. they're they're saying that this the brains going way back were probably <coughs> giving uh, the the structure the circuitry that would allow them to do this very complicated um, coordinated behavior motor behavior. Gesundheit black, but that is it's <laughs> it's still sort of I don't know I. I Ah, I question. Ah, I question ah. the flight readiness of a brain as being. I don't. I still don't get it. <laughs> well, I mean, it would have to be. It, the idea then is that you, you. It would have to be that you have the the, the machinery. You have the circuits, to, right? Capable, but it's not capable. like. And you have the circuits that could potentially 
develop to allow a coordinated motor skill so to flight develop. requires so. intelligence but it's not like i mean we don't want to uh, here, here's what i'm flight here's what i'm comparing it to yeah. here's what i'm comparing it to and this is why i think i was getting stumbled on this i was tr trying to picture like if, you know, some future some future future humans or other species, squid people, thousands of years, thousands and th hundreds of thousands of years from now, looking back and saying, and you can see here the development of Homo erectus indicates the pre-driving a car circuitry for modern man. I mean, it's almost, is it, is it that that brain power is required for, for the activity? Or, but not, not, there's not that there's an actual connection between having that brain capacity and being able to do it. Right. Okay. Okay, so that makes right. sense. Yeah. Flight probably wouldn't have developed if uh, avian brains didn't get bigger. If they weren't bigger first. Okay. Oh, well, that makes sense. It's the idea that it was... Yeah, and getting so ready for flight. But. Yeah, so the the study here, it, there are um, fossil examples that things like the wishbone are not necessarily a bird only trait. Hmm. So you, you know what your your turkey dinner wishbone um, is that wishbone evolved in other non avian dinosaurs separately or earlier in an earlier lineage. So along with those morphological traits. For movement and the and the and the limbs changing, um, the brain case and the brain structure was also changing previous or prior to the actual evolution of this bird lineage. So, the birds that we thought they were so special, the dinosaurs, you know, before them, they were special too. So now, not only are we going to find that dinosaurs were warm-blooded. We're going to find that they're more intelligent than we thought they were. Probably. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or at least they were way more coordinated. Well, they uh, had to have some stuff going right to be dominating all these niches at the time. Right. Yeah. They had to have all these things that were a lot more intense than just being big. Right. Mm -hmm. I agree with that, totally. Mm -hmm. um, in other bird news... Bird sexual selection. How does a male woo a female? When the female is looking at the male bird, what's the female looking at? The the historical example, the the the, the example that is used in all the te textbooks for bird sexual selection is the peacock. The peacock cock cock with its tail, right? Shake your tail feathers. Those wonderful dramatic t feathers that fan out with the uh, the look of eyes all over them. You think, looking at it, that it is the drama of um, all of these eye-like structures all over the tail that are what the female would be looking at. How many are there? Are they very so, bright? Are they brilliant? What is it, It's something that would catch their eye, right? Yeah, but K Kirsten? Yes. That would that that story I think was was two weeks ago in science. Two weeks ago. <laughs> you didn't watch oh. our show last week. Oh, I didn't. Mm. Oh, we did all that right. Story. Yeah. Okay. That's all so. right. I'd love to hear your take on it. <laughs> <laughs> I was out of town last week. No, didn't listen to the show. No, so I can't nice. believe you didn't listen to our show. You were so saying nice. how great we did. And now Good I know. Job. She's just <laughs> all up. I just trust you. Yeah, I can't believe you told her. I was gonna let her go. You're just gonna let it roll. <laughs> just say nothing. Darn it. Darn it. Flashy car from last week's show. Yeah. yeah. Females not looking at the eyeballs. The females just looking at the shaking of the tail feathers. And I think it was was it McLeod or Illustrator who was like. My eyes are down here. Hello? Yes. My eyes are down here. Do you mind? <laughs> Very funny. Was, yeah, sorry. so what I was reading was that it was the width uh, specifically as opposed to height. They thought height would right. have a lot to do with yes. it, but it's, it's all about the girth. Oh, dear. It okay. is. It's the girth of the feathers. The feather. Yeah. How wide are they? All right, so we'll move on from that story since it's already been done. 724, I guess that would have been like just mm -hmm. last Thursday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, all right, fine. Uh, keep, cockatoos. You got to keep it in this week. Keep it in this week. Cockatoos. 
cockatoos <sighs> are really smart. They're smart like your four-year-old or smart like a, a, a chimpanzee, right? What? Yes, cockatoos. Thanks to Blair, this, I, uh, I have, this story came to my attention, published in the Journal of Comparative Psychology. Um, some researchers from uh, Vienna and the University of Oxford and I think someplace else, um, maybe in France or something, have uh, co collaborate, collaborated, see if I can speak today, looking at uh, the intelligence, spatial intelligence of cockatoos. Cockatoos are known to be a very playful, intelligent species of parrot. And their studies looked at uh, whether or not these birds would be able to rotate objects, be able to remember or know that an object is behind something else, otherwise known as object permanence. And this is something that um, many toddlers uh, don't have for at least, at least two to three years. Um, so uh, if you have something like, here, I have this, look at this. And then I've got this glass of wine. And oh, I put the glass of wine behind. It's gone. Wait, Kirsten, where did it go? That was amazing. It's, I'm drinking it. It disappeared. It. Wow. Oh, it's still there. Oh, it's back again. Oh, my God. That's <laughs> exactly. How did you do that? You had it, but it's it was magic. like it disappeared. It was magic gone. trick. And then the other object was in front of it. And then you pulled that out. Wait, it reappeared. That was stunning. Exactly. Um, so they used very similar to tests to what have been used in other uh, in other species involved in, including human infants. Um, they move a food reward behind something to see if the animal because if an animal really desires something, is their ability to track it and to know that it's there? Is it going to be stronger? Um, or just an object? Can they just remember? just something, an object being put underneath a cup or, or behind a screen. Um, so they displaced a, a couple of, a, a few different objects and basically they found that these birds are capable of uh, rotation, uh, displacements, and uh, transposition and translocation. So these birds are capable of all sorts of um, of complicated spatial memory tasks. Um, so, so wait, they, they said so the, they conclude finding that goffins, these goffin cockatoos, solve transposition, rotation, and translocation tasks, which are likely to pose a large cognitive load on working memory, was surprising, and calls for more comparative data in order to better understand the relevance of such accurate tracking abilities in terms of ecology and sociality. So the question is, why? It, what they're basically saying here is why these birds specifically? What would make these particular cockatoos, this species, more capable of these tasks than another species. Mm -hmm. Ecologically, why is it important for them to have the intelligence or and the brain power, the working memory power to be able to hold a lot of stuff in their head and know where things have gone when well, other birds about it, can't? If you think about it, a lot of birds do a lot of social tasks and social living that requires them to be aware that other birds are there when they can't see them. Right. Like, especially with parrots, they're known to, early in the morning, call out to their entire family, go, are you still alive? Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. still alive. Are you still alive? Yeah, I'm still alive. If you can't physically see them in the canopies, why do you know even to call to them? Because what they're looking at with the cockatoos that happens in two-year-old babies is that when you see mom leave the room, you think mm -hmm. she ceased to exist. Yeah. And yeah. so the fact that even though you can't see it, it still exists, that's something that those parrots have to deal with every day in the canopies of the rainforest. I'm not super surprised. But I also think it's interesting. I'm not sure that they've really tested this on all species that they... No, I because would I think about it, they haven't. Yeah, because working with animals, there are a lot of species where I show them a banana or a treat of some sort, and it goes behind my back or it goes into a pocket. And they still know it's there for sure, even if they can't mm. smell it. They know exactly so, where it is. 
so this is, I think, mm -hmm. one of the things that was really interesting about this, this study is that the object didn't have to be of interest. Because if it's something that your animal control brain is using some dedicated neurons to like track, like that's food, mm -hmm. or that's something interesting, or that's a threat, it makes sense uh, that any, just about any animal should be tracking that. Any, you know, at any level, even if it has disappeared. I mean, if if the cat just goes behind the screen, the mouse isn't like, oh, no cats exist, right? It's still like uh, something was just there. So what I think is really amazing about this is that objects that wouldn't necessarily be of any interest were still trackable, which shows which shows a casual uh, ability to track things, uh, almost uh, almost sort of a. Uh, tracking it because the brain has free resources. It's like almost bored enough to track anything going on. Almost, almost a higher level of cognitive ability than if it were just that that object that was of specific interest. Yeah, having having those resources available just to think about things. Yeah. So I, th but I think I think you know, in this they, um, you know, they mainly worked with rewards. In the tests, so they did have, they did have rewards that. They but wasn't part. I thought part of what you said was they were hiding objects that weren't of a specific desirable well, ability. Yeah, for some for some tasks. So in, in in some. I mean, you do have a you have a control to see. You know, if you just have an object, will they follow it? But sometimes you just you lose their attention if you don't have something they're really interested in. Um, and so, you know, you can have something like a toy also, something that's not necessarily a food reward. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. I think it's just, it's chalk it up to, again, birds have been underestimated and animals in general, I think, are being underestimated with a lot of this stuff. I feel like that's my bottom line almost every week in my animal corner too. Is <laughs> guess what? We <laughs> underestimated these animals. That, or we've guess just what? been greatly overestimating babies. Ah, that too. <laughs> no. Yeah, totally. <laughs> what? No. We're not as special as we think. Nope. Babies aren't as smart as you might have thought they were. Uh, oh my goodness! All right, Justin, what do you have? Okay. Uh, t -t 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 oh, BPAs. We are kind of aware bisphenol A is getting into everything. It's on all of our receipt paper. Uh, it's been known to be sort of a uh, synthetic estrogen causing problems in rats. Here's the uh, study that was done. has shown that BPA has a direct effect on egg maturation in humans, says Dr. Rakowski. Because exposure to BPA is so ubiquitous, patients and medical professionals should be aware that BPA may cause significant disruption in the fundamentals of human reproductive process and may play a role in unexplained infertility. A randomized trial examined 352 eggs from 121 consenting patients at a fertility clinic. The eggs, which would have otherwise been discarded, were exposed to varying levels of BPA in the laboratory setting. An egg from each patient was not exposed to BPA and served as the control. Researchers then examined the eggs and found that exposure to BPA caused decrease in the percentage of eggs that matured, an increase in the percentage of the eggs that degenerated an increase in the percentage of eggs that underwent spontaneous activation, the abnormal process, when an egg acts as though it has been fertilized, even though it has not been. Hmm. Hmm. As the BPA dose increased, there was a decreased likelihood of maturity, an increased likelihood of de degeneration, and an increased likelihood of spontaneous activation. Additionally, among the mature eggs, there was a significant trend toward a decreased incidence of bipolar spindles and aligned chromosomes with an increased dose of BPA. Researchers note that these results are similar to the previous research examining the imp impact of BPA exposure to animal eggs. So basically what it means is there's a, you know, a very good chance so that perhaps if you are experiencing infertility, you need to remove BPA from your system. Huh. I wonder if it could affect animals in the environment via pollution. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Yeah, totally. Like Absolutely. fish, we, we're having this mm -hmm. weird population problem with fish because of estrogen in people's urine from using birth control pills. Right. I'm wondering if this also could go through the person, enter the water column, and also go yes, from pollution into the water it column. Has. It already has. Yeah. In yeah. Fact, so this the... could be a contribution to that. It's not just the birth control pills. It's the BPAs also. Yeah, and it's actually in our water supply to some extent now. And this is this is actually an increasing problem because one of the treatments that we use to purify our water system is chlorine. This is how we, you know, one of the big portions in which how we clean the water that we drink. And it, of course, has no effect on reducing the levels of BPA. No. Yeah, so it's Not this good. main chemical screen we have to kill... A lot of stuff uh, is, does not affect this at all. So, yeah. Well, I think it's interesting yeah. that something that's totally man-made and unnatural is causing problems. <laughs> it, <laughs> hey, plastics! Who would have thought? It's, <laughs> who would have thought? It's rare. Yeah. It's happened. Con Actually, probably that's the number one sort of contaminator, yeah. I guess, yeah. because everything else we're evolved to be able to deal with for the most mm -hmm. part. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. always wary, too, of all of the new plastics that don't have BPA in them. I think it's fantastic, and I'm all for it, and it's better than not having BPAs. But what's going to be the next thing that we find in plastics that's not good for us? <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. And I think, I, you know, the thing that we have to worry about are the persistent um, organic compounds. So mm -hmm. things that end up in the environment that don't go away, that, you know, are, that just stay there. And they don't. Uh, they just sit in the soil, or they stay in the water, and they build up, and they build up, and they build up. Yeah. The more that we use them, and so um, I think those are the ones that we really, really need to worry about. Although actually, I think I think uh, BPAs really were much more of a direct threat because they were being used in things like uh, baby binkies, baby yeah. bottles. You know, yeah. things that. People were putting in their mouths. It's, this, which... it's in the, the lining of tin cans. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think Bring we're pretty food, lucky, though, that water. only less than 30 years ago is when really plastic water bottles started happening. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it's actually a pretty quick turnover that we figured out this thing is bad for us <laughs> and it. we're starting to get know. rid of it. And I'm very thankful for that because this could have gone for a long time before people started to point at it if we were in any other generation. I think in and this I, generation, because we're so science forward and people are studying this kind of stuff, yeah. that we were able to have a very quick turnaround and go, actually, all oh, these plastic water bottles are not great. The question is now whether we can actually get rid of the plastic water bottles or not. Right. Which and the, the thing, yeah. Do you, do you think that we can have enough, enough public outcry and enough public pressure to get rid of plastic water bottles within a generation? No. I think it would be cool. So, so it is, would be great. Is, it would be awesome. Mm -hmm. What would we have instead, though? That's what I'm not sure. What can you get from a from a vending machine to get fresh water in? Uh, you could yeah. do with a, yeah. yeah, we could Glass have been... bottles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which make it, Clunk makes it more crash. expensive. Yeah. Yeah. So so this is not this easy. is just I'm trying to find the woman's name who made the initial discovery. Oh, uh, where is it? Because it wasn't it, and it, this was she discovered it, and there was a major pushback against her discovery because nobody wanted to pull this out. I mean, yeah. major industry was involved. Of not. So if it wasn't for her and her stick to itiveness and her getting loud and really making this a a public issue, we still would not know, even though the discovery would have been made. Um, gosh, Fantastic. I, I can't seem to. Yeah, I can't Ooh, find it. They've got the person who discovered it. They've got the company that used it. That her name is missing from at least the Wikipedia. That's that's too bad because this is. We will I will find it by the end of the, the episode. Great, wonderful. This is this week in science. Blair, it's time for Blair's Animal Corner with Blair works at an aquarium. Like hippos and fish, but not polar bears or pandas. Or I like squirrels. Yeah, that's right. Oh, squirrels. It's yeah. Growing Don't get my likes and dislikes wrong, Justin. <laughs> 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 okay, so first off, spiders. They're already terrifying. Now they have individual personalities. 
Huh? What? Yeah. Well, wasn't it like a couple of weeks ago you reported that they were like working together as teams? Yes. <laughs> it just gets worse and worse, doesn't it? Man. The, All right. I'm going to butcher the Latin name now. Everyone prepare. Stegodyphus saracenorum spider from India has been studied and they found that they have different personality traits from one another. They specifically looked at boldness as the first personality trait that they could study because it was the easiest thing for them to study with itsy bitty spiders. What they did is they took these spiders from the wild and they tested them for aggress aggression, aggressiveness, directly they, they pulled their own web off of a tree, kept the web intact, brought it into the lab, and threw stuff into their web. And they checked <laughs> how aggressive they were at, at going towards potential food sources in their own web without waiting around to see if it stopped moving, waiting to see what it was exactly. Maybe they just jumped right out there. They found there was a varying level of response. And then what they did is they took the spiders out of their original web, put them in artificial ones in trees near the facility, and then they threw things into this brand new web to see if their actions paralleled. What they found was that the spiders that exhibited the most aggression in the first part of the study were the very same ones that acted the most boldly when insects became stuck in the new webs. And so what they concluded from this was that there were individualized personality traits in those specific spiders. Most likely it determined what kind of job they had, which ones were bolder tended to be the ones that, deal, uh, that dealt with captured prey, and those that were meeker spent more time nurturing offspring or engaging in less confrontational tasks. Huh. So it's somewhat job related, but they mm -hmm. had consistent responses on this boldness index in different environments which would indicate a personality. Yeah, well, in humans it's uh suggested that about gosh, 50%, I mean 50% or so of your uh your personality is genetically determined. Mm. So, uh and then the the rest of course is environment and mm -hmm. uh experience. So 50% is going to be specifically determining whether or not you are outgoing, whether you are, um, you know, someone who stays at home and reads reads books. Uh, so maybe there, uh, maybe this kind of a um, genetic separating of societal roles goes way back. You know, goes, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, that it's important for any organism to have an, an array of different types because different types are going to do better in different situations. Yeah, so th this is the question then is how much of this is based, I would like to see an index of this based on other physical traits. Yeah. If certain physical attributes lead you to have a certain personality. Mm -hmm. Or if this is something, like you said, that is developed afterwards, if it's predisposed or if it's something that happens based on experience. That right. has a lot more, I think, to say whether a spider has personality or not. Right now, I think it's clear they have jobs. Like they were saying in the, in the article, <laughs> they have jobs. And their jobs come... So someone in the chat room was asking, why wouldn't spiders have personalities? The idea is, since they have just this teeny tiny nerve ball of a brain, that it's a very simple calculator. It's not a graphing calculator. It's not something that can come up with all these different ideas. It's a simple plus minus multiply divide calculator, meaning when they're faced with a series of variables in their life, it's a simple computation and they do what is the most easy thing to do in that case or the most evolutionarily 
beneficial thing to do in that case. And most of the time, there's not going to be a huge difference from one ball of nerves to the next. Right. So I think that's the assumption that was made with a lot of these smaller animals with smaller brains. Cloned brains. Right. Exactly. It's, like I said, it's less of a graphing calculator. It's more of a simple desktop calculator. So... Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking surprised. here. Surprised? I'm not. I'm not surprised. No, again, once again, one of your stories. I'm not really surprised that there's, there's a little bit more complexity here than what people thought originally, but yeah. um, especially within a species that has a separation of roles, that there are different jobs that different individuals do. If there is some kind of difference in jobs, there will be some kind of difference in the brain and a difference in the way that they respond to stimuli. Mm -hmm. um, if you know, for example, you're talking about just cockroaches, and all of the cockroaches are just cockroaches, and they don't have different jobs. They just scuttle around looking for food and laying eggs and having more cockroaches. Then you would expect that they'd have a fairly standardized curve of responses, as opposed to so if you're if you're looking at uh, the way the an individual in my example, cockroach responds to light, for example. How fast does it scut scuttle away um, or whatever measure you use? You would probably expect that in this species you see a normalized curve with just mm -hmm. one central mean, where right, most right. of the individuals fall around that, that mm -hmm. central mean. Um, but in the case of these spiders where they have different roles, you're going to have two peaks. You're going to have two right. separate curves. Right. That's You would expect that, right? I, I would think so. I think that mm -hmm. makes sense. Maybe just we weren't expecting that in spiders. Maybe there was not so much <laughs> indication <laughs> in these teeny tiny animals like cockroaches or spiders that you would have a distinction. Maybe that a distinction would be based on other factors besides something that is innate that other outside variables can't change, which I think is why this study was considered interesting and new, is that they changed some external variables and the spiders act the same. Right. And taken out of their own context and put in with other, other exterior stimuli, they still acted within their personality parameters. Right. So next time you see a spider on the wall, I think that's what was really interesting to me, is at first I went, of course spiders have personalities, but you, then you think about it in your own life, you see a spider on the wall, you don't really think about that spider as being different from any other spider in the world. You go, smash it, or no! put it in, oh, put no, it in no, a no, jar, no, put it in a no, jar, no, move it outside. outside. Yes. Oh, spiders are nice, <laughs> spiders are our friends, spiders kill mosquitoes. Spiders exactly. are, spiders are, are our friends, I'm sorry. Spiders are good. I'm sorry I said smash it. I do Spiders believe that is nice. probably what a lot of people think immediately. Yes, no. but it, definitely. No. But I think also, no. I would have thought that. spider on the wall is out for a specific reason and going to a specific place based on what spiders do. But spiders don't and just do spider things. They have their own personalities, just depending yeah. on the individual, which I think is awesome. Yeah, and they're got very one curious. spider on the wall going, I'm Spider-Man. And another spider on the wall going, I'm Batman. <laughs> and a third spider going, I'm scared. <laughs> I'm scared of Give spiders. Me a spider. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you spiders are crazy. Look, <laughs> spiders are courteous. Like, they go up into the corner and build a web up on the ceiling. Like, they don't, like, take up space that you're trying to occupy. They don't go after your food. As and they protect they're you when you bed. sleep. From, or my shoes. They protect you when you sleep from mosquitoes. I, I love spiders. Mm -hmm. Except for when you're eating them in your sleep. <laughs> Sorry. By the way, by the way <laughs> that, is, that is such a myth. This, this, okay, there, well, later I can talk to you about the spider. Never mind, I'm not even going to do it. I'm not going to do it. You found you're spider. all welcome. You're all welcome that I'm not going into the story. Just trust me, it's disgusting, and it would keep you up tonight, so I'm avoiding it. All right? But where was the later, spider? we'll get to it later. Later, we can talk about it. Let's but talk right now, about it later. I want to talk about one other individuality thing with animals that I learned about this week. All right. Dolphins. Dolphins 
give each other their own names. So cool, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, Bob. Hey, Jean. Exactly, except it's... <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So uh, Scotland's University of St. Andrews found that bottlenose dolphins develop unique whistles that they use to call out and identify individuals within the pod. Pretty cool. Very cool. Yeah, they have their own dolphin name. Hmm. What they did is they had kind of an idea that that's what was going on. So it, they, they recorded a bunch of sounds. They recorded sounds that they called to each other and then another dolphin would respond. When a given sound was played, the dolphin to which it corresponded would always answer back when they were recording it. One individual dolphin would respond to each different name, quote unquote. Huh. And when they played unfamiliar sounds, nobody said anything. That's cool. Going back to the cockatoo study, yeah. I just wonder if social birds like the cockatoo, you said that the cockatoos call out to each other, kind of going, are you there? Are you there? Are you there? I wonder if they do something similar. I wonder if there is a very slight difference in the way that they call out. But anyway, go on with your dog. By, by I would way, suspect also, that gonna, they do because yeah. when you train parrots, they respond to names that you give them. Yeah. yeah. And they will say their names yeah. in response. I'm, I'm terrified, yeah. by, by the way, of the image of the morning uh, jungle and the cockatoo who's calling out, Are you alive? Are you alive? Are you alive? Because I just got this horrible feeling of every morning waking up, calling everybody you know, Are you still alive? Jimmy! Did you get eaten? Did you hear? No, I haven't heard back. I haven't heard a word from him. And dang, right. <laughs> yesterday morning was the same thing. Dang, get eaten. It's just what a horrifying. It's rough to be a parent, I'm telling you. <laughs> That's why they have such good ca camouflage. Mm, yeah. Hide from the snakes. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Right. So, anywho. It must be like what it's like to be like 80 something. <laughs> Calling all your friends in the morning. I'm glad you picked up. Yeah, no, <laughs> I'm just calling to say hello. Hey, yeah, that's it. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, bye bye. Yeah. <laughs> so, hello? In, in this article, they attribute the dolphins being able to use names as a necessity because they live in a three dimensional environment. They don't have specific landmarks because they can often be out of sight of land. They want to stay together as a group. They are the most powerful in a group. And they often can't even see each other when they're still traveling in a pod. They can't smell underwater. And so they don't even have a normal nesting or hangout spot within the water. They're pretty nomadic. Based on all that, you have to be able to have some sort of containment within the group and go, hey, hey, Larry, we're going this way. So uh, it makes sense, but like we were saying, I, I kind of expect to see that in other animals as well. I don't think this yeah. is the only animal that uses names, based on I've... the fact that orcas. All animals, yeah, orcas. All the animals that we can train to a name, they don't know that's their name, but they know that that's a sound they respond to, which is all the dolphins mm -hmm. are doing too. This yeah. is the sound I hear, and then I personally respond. If you yell out your dog's name amongst five dogs, only one of them is going to show the intent that will indicate that they know what that name means, if they're unless, trained. Unless you say it the right way. Right. Unless you're holding <laughs> bacon. But so, dogs essentially understand names. The question is whether yeah. or not wolves use names within their own language. We've hmm. We've proven that hyraxes have specific sounds to speak to each other and that they have syntax. Right. I think right. animal language is just far more complicated than we could ever begin to think that we completely understand. Yeah. Although, great but, point about them being uh, you know, nomadic and mm -hmm. uh, in the, they, I mean, there isn't a place they're going to go back to to meet up again. And mm -hmm. the range at which they can communicate underwater, I'm not sure what dolphins, but... I. I my understanding is it's whales miles, can, I think, yeah. Yeah, my, whales can go many, many, I mean, just like hundreds of miles uh, because of the, t the type of tones they're using is so low. I don't know where the where the dolphin fits into that sort of distance of communication. I mean, I, actually, when I say hundreds of miles, I think it's actually... Elephants! I think they, mm -hmm. they can communicate across big, vast yeah. swaths of mm -hmm. the ocean. 
Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, that makes sense that you would need to develop some unique communication skills. I'm, I'm trying to think of what other animals would need to be many, able to do that. Many, many anything animals. That hunts, yes, definitely. Be, or that's or that's social and uh, it relies on their pack, their group, to be able. And to probably a smaller things. number. It's more important. I bet you the larger the grouping, I bet you prairie dogs haven't named everybody in the pack. Probably not. <laughs> no. It's prairie dog in front of me. But prairie dog I'll tell left. you what. Prairie, dog prairie dogs right. know A, B, and C group. Oh, which is still hierarchies. definitely so maybe, almost... Maybe they can name their groups. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it's still a hierarchy of, of group names, which you could see yeah. bringing you towards individual names. That's yeah. that's definitely yeah. a stepwise process. All right, everybody, we mm-hmm. we were talking about this for uh, like f- a long time, and it's all it's almost already almost nine o'clock. We're diving in. We haven't even gotten to the break yet. So I have, like, seven more stories today. Yeah, I know. We've got a lot more to go, and we haven't gotten. Yeah. So mm. anyway, we're gonna take a break. Think about animals. Think about what what you would name your friend if you were a dolphin. Oh, 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 oh that's sea lion. I'm sorry. <laughs> sea lion. What is that? Whatever. That's a sea lion. And this week in science, we'll be back in just a few moments. Stay tuned. Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 100,000 audiobooks in their library. What's an audiobook? It's a little file that you download to your mobile device that you can take with you. You can listen to it. And it's a book. You can listen to it instead of reading. So you can listen to it while you're driving or while you're staring off into space. They're pretty awesome that way. And you can get a free one if you sign up for Audible's services right now. Do it right now. Sign up for their services. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash twist. You'll get a free audio book download just for signing up for their service. And then we get a little kickback, which is kind of awesome. Helps us out in a little way. It's wonderful. You also want to help us out in a different way? You can buy our swag. We have a Zazzle.com store. Go to twist.org, our, our website, and you look along the homepage for the store tab. It's Zazzle store. Click there. You're able to find t-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, things, swag. You can wear, you can support, you can share. Twist. And then finally, if these are not the ways that you would like to support us, but you would like to help us out another way, donations are always, always appreciated. And we also, if, you, if you're not able to donate money we, if, and you think you can help us out in some way, donations of time are also very appreciated. So we uh, accept donations of time. Just contact me, Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. Or uh, if you want to donate some cash, which we make it very easy, just go to our website, PayPal, buttons in pink all over the place. Go to the most recent episode, listen to it, scroll through the show notes, and then at the bottom of the page, pick an option to pay by PayPal and donate to help us do all the things that we do. Thank you for, for your support. We really, really could not do this without you. And we're back with more This Week in Science. Oh, yeah. 
We are back with more. So we have a lot of stories to get through. Let's see what we can do in just a few mm-hmm. minutes each. Mm-hmm. Okay, I had a whole bunch of stories about mice and rats and cool, crazy things going on in mice and rats. Uh, A team publishing in Nature Biotechnology at UCL Institute of Ophthalmology and Moorfields Eye Hospital got photoreceptors from a synthetic retina. Synthetic retina. They grew it in a Petri dish. And they used... um, 3D cell culturing, so a bunch of layers of cells in the dish able able to grow uh, photoreceptors and then they implanted those cells into um, into blind mice. Three blind mice, night blind mice, uh, night blind mice actually and these photoreceptors were grown from embryonic stem cells. So, uh, mice with night blindness, mm-hmm. which is not great for a mouse, mm-hmm. uh, were had em, uh, embryonic stem cell sourced photoreceptors that were grown in a petri dish, implanted into their retinas, and uh, had neural connections form that allowed them to see. What does night blindness entail does that mean a rod deficiency or what does that mean yeah. Yeah. rod deficiency okay. I'm just thinking for my own selfish reasons I wonder if through stem cells I could get some cones put in here and I could get my color vision upped ah. yeah increased I could get actual color vision that'd there, be pretty sweet there was a story that, that came through with my brain filter at some point this last week uh, I think a 70 year old man who was blind since birth, mm-hmm. fell down, was getting something done um, at the hospital, and they were like, oh, by the way, uh, we could fix your eyes while you're here, if you like. And he went underwent some sort of cardiac, uh, cardiac, uh, cataract-type surgery, mm-hmm. that was apparently uh-huh. a new surgery, and restored, not restored, gave him vision for the first time in his life at That's age cool. 70. What? Yes. Wow. Yeah. And he's uh, was quoted uh, um, saying something along the lines of, I, it's like I get to be a child and rediscover the world all over again. Wow. Um, supposedly one of the, the other things that's been an interesting competition uh, in his head is uh, rectifying his his touch feel sense which is enormously mm. acute right because he his, hasn't been able to see vision of touching something mm-hmm. um, are seem it seem to be somewhat out of sync as I guess we can try to imagine right because um, they, they didn't develop at the same time they didn't ve- develop together right and his touch sense is you know an enormous map in his brain yeah and the visual sense is just getting Dang. formed yeah so, and now you have the the touch sense and the visual sense probably fighting for space because vision is like I want more room, give me yeah, more and space. Yeah, and I would assume maybe not at age seventy. Uh, I would assume that vision would win out, and and like, but maybe not. Maybe but this how is... interesting to find yeah. that out. I mean, right. if that does happen, and it's able, and and researchers are able to show that and able to follow the progress of. Uh, the the change in his vision, I, what and it will I, show I don't... is basically that the brain remains incredibly plastic, in, well into old age. And, you know? and it's one of those things too that I I don't know that this guy is actually getting a proper research following to do. Ah. I don't know that anybody's actually. This wasn't like, as part of this new research, we will do this. It was just the doctors at the hospital being like, by the way, HMO covers this. So we could do it. We could fix your eyes. <laughs> and, wow. and so I don't, I don't know how much other than his own, uh, you know, getting interviewed around the time that this story is broken is going to be pursued. But that, yeah. he would definitely be somebody, uh, if you're looking for a, uh, a thesis. <laughs> <laughs> Follow <neurology>. that <laughs> 
bam, here it is. This is the winner right here. Yeah. Um, more mouse research. Uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology team used optogenetics, which involves the use of light to control brain circuits very precisely to turn things on and off. Um, it uh, The control expresses proteins that basically, like I said, switch things on and off in very particular types of brain cells. Uh, these researchers used optogenetics to create a false memory in the brains of mice. So they made mice fear a place they had no reason to fear. So what they did is uh, they um, installed optogenetic triggers in the neurons that were busy while uh, in the place cells that get active while a mouse is exploring a new environment. So while a mouse is exploring someplace new, there are these group of cells that go bing, 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 oh that's a corner, that's a wall, this is this, that's that, and make a map of this new environment. And the next day, they gave the mouse little tiny electric shocks eek, 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 while the mouse was, uh, while they triggered the memory of place A using optogenetics, using light. So basically, they use the optogenetics, the light, to trigger the pathways of the neurons that were active while exploring when the mouse was not being shocked and was going, this is a very nice place. I think I might move in. I wonder if the food is good here. They used this technique to make the mouse afraid of this location that they had never, ever been afraid of before. False memories. This is the beginning of the future, people. Don't let anyone put light in your head. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, so even though really, this I mean, this just goes to the, you know, at the end of the show where, like, it's all in your head, this really gets to the core of that, that there are, your reality is in your head. This these The reality of these mice is in their head, in the neurons of their brain. They have a memory of this location that they, they had explored that was perfectly safe, but then while that memory was being triggered and another harmful stimulus was applied to them, they were bound together to create a new memory of bad place. And so the mice did not ever want to go into this place sure. again. It's really interesting. Sweet. Very very science fiction-y. Very science fiction-y. Um, and what was the last one? Oh yeah, new brain computer interface that allows us to control a rat. So brain computer interface so that you instead of controlling a ping pong ball or a poop 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 play pong with your brain on a computer screen, you can now send information directly to the brain of a rat and make a rat do what you want. Wow. Isn't this exciting? You can just fiddle with everybody's brains, can't we? Yeah, I, can't, I mean, it's not I exactly do. I'm, I am sensationalizing this a bit, little bit. It's not do what you want. I mean, it's you can, you can get a, a rat to move its tail, flick its yeah. tail at this point. But mm -hmm. once again, it is the beginning. Mm -hmm. One day yes. we will control all rodents in the world. <laughs> It, it, it's interesting it's to me this story, the, both these stories, for, for on a couple of levels. The, I think the biggest one is we're amazed in a science fictiony way that that reactions to things that that, uh, that memories can be altered, that uh, ideas can be implanted uh, in a, in a sense this way. And yet we are capable of doing this constantly through media, <laughs> through through literature, through art, through conversation in, in some sense even alone is able to, to do this, to make these correlations. It's a little bit more direct. It gets rid of the author, the artist, the media, uh, the, the propaganda campaign or the publicity campaign or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, it's already possible to tinker with brains and memories from the outside. This mm -hmm. just uh, gets right to the 
<laughs> it's try, trying to get right to the heart of it. I think right, so. I've got to I got to get through a couple of these here. Uh, let's see. This is do, 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 no, not this one. Uh, oh, the Tesla dream. This is Tesla, who is, if you've been any time listener of the show, you know, is my favorite scientist in all of history, famous fav, uh, favorite inventor throughout all of history. And it's kind of crazy. Per what? He cared for pigeons. <laughs> he ca he cared for sick pigeons, Kirsten. I thought you this would be somebody. I didn't you... say that. And he did. He did order. He did always order everything in threes and such towards the end of his life. But he, you know, he's the guy who invented the alternating current. He figured out instead, instead of sending. Stop. It. What happened? What's going on? Instead of trying to send electricity and force it down the wire continually, and having all these boosters all the way down the run. Uh, he figured out that you could send it, bring it back, send it, bring it back, send it, bring it back a little, send it, bring it back a little, send it, bring it back. And that by that method, we could move electricity down in the entire wire from one location, and it could go any distance, pretty much. It may, it's the electricity that we all use today, not the much more uh, inefficient direct current. But uh, so anyway, he had many, many amazing inventions. Of course, he invented the remote control. Uh, he invented radio. He did, the list is actually, I, I believe he may have even been on the forefront of microwave technology and just about, just about everything that this modern world has and uses, Tesla has touched in some, in some way. But one of the dreams he had, one of the things he wanted to do uh, which people were really afraid of. Uh, it was hard to get funding for this idea. He wanted to do, create wireless power transfer so that instead of having uh, a, a line that runs to the home and has things wired in, that you would be able to power your entire house wirelessly. Uh, he also invented the fluorescent bulb. is one of those things that he could demonstrate being able to illuminate uh, from a separate power source. But... Of course, it's hard to get funding for somebody who's saying, yeah, we're going to generate all this electricity and then give it to everybody for free, <laughs> right? Uh, but here's, here's some research that may be getting, to the, getting us to that point. Uh, here we go. What happens to a resonant wireless power transfer system in the presence of complex electromagnetic environments such as metal plates? A team of researchers explored the influences that play in this type of situation and they describe it in the American Institute of Physics journal AIP Advances. How efficient wireless power transfer can indeed be achieved in the presence of metal plates. The team discovered that resonant, resonance frequency matching, which is, this is something that Tesla also created in the entire concept of being able to do, he did amazing things with resonant frequencies. Believed he could, he could break the earth in half, in, in fact, if he was challenged to do so. Team discovered that resonance frequency matching, alignment of magnetic field, and impedance matching are the most important factors for efficient wireless transfer. These findings are highly significant, they say, because one futuristic application of wireless power transfer would be to harness and use it via magnetic resonance to charge electric vehicles. This, this concept right here would change everything in the auto industry. The one major drawback to electric vehicles is the duration of time it takes to charge them and the distance they can go on a full charge. If you have it set up in some way where as you're driving the vehicle is charging, you never have to fuel up. It's, we, we pour, you know, the highway system itself can be charging vehicles. This is very futury, but still, that's the idea. Corresponding coils attached to the bottom of an electric vehicle would pick up energy as the vehicle passes over the coils embedded in the highway. With this type of dynamic charging, the electric vehicle's driving range could become unlimited, and the size of its batteries would be greatly reduced. Wireless power transfer technology may find use in a wide range of applications beyond vehicles, says Sai uh, uh, Zhao Feng Yu, an electrical engineer and postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University who led the research. Other applications may include charging mobile devices, home appliances, implanted medical devices in the human body, 
Uh, but certainly, certainly, that that one big hurdle to the battery uh, charging times and the distance that the vehicle can travel would absolutely, I mean, overnight, and after many, many decades of fighting to have the infrastructure put in, yeah. revolutionize the automotive industry. Uh, because that's, that, that right now is the, the biggest drawback to the, the pure electric vehicle. Hmm. That's cool. Very, very cool. Hmm. There's a uh, another study, if I can find it here, um, related to energy. There's a University of Colorado Boulder team that has developed a technique for splitting uh, water into hydrogen and oxygen uh, oh, that uses so sunlight to split the water, which is something that, uh, this is something that teams around the world have been working on trying to do because once you have an efficient method of using sunlight to split water into hydrogen and oxygen, suddenly you have a very easy way to create a hydrogen fuel source. I mean, this is not necessarily the wireless electricity you know, that you're talking about, but this is the kind of thing that could lead to hydrogen fuel cells in people's houses, you know, where you have a solar panel on your roof, you have, or something hooked up to a fuel cell, and suddenly you've got your own power in your house, and you don't need to be a part of the grid anymore. Um, so this team devised a solar thermal system that they could use sunlight concentrated by a bunch of mirrors onto a central point on a tower that's a really tall tower so all these mirrors focused on this tower and so as the sun goes across the mirrors catch it and the light is always focused on the top of the tower the tower gathers heat and then it gets super hot and that heat is delivered to a reactor with metal oxides or chemical compounds uh, the metal oxide compound would heat up and release oxygen and uh, that would cause, the, it changes its material compound according to this article and that would lead it to seek out new oxygen atoms. Adding steam, you'd end up with oxygen from the water molecules adhering to the metal oxide, it frees up hydrogen and then you have hydrogen gas. So you couldn't necessarily do this in your house but this is like the kind of thing once you get a system in place you can maybe make it smaller, more portable, you can develop a way to do this um, for large, uh, for large hydrogen fuel stations. For small, there are a bunch of interesting, interesting potential uh, developments that can come out of this. And this is something that nobody's really done before. So it's a very exciting, exciting development. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, strengths, strengths in the chat room uh, regarding the the. the the recharging roadway, um, Tesla-ish story, then everyone would be stealing the charging energy from the roads to charge their households. Yeah, or, or can you imagine, like, okay, hey, honey, make sure you take all the AAA batteries with you. Yeah, plug them in the car. Yeah, we just want them charged up by the time. Mm -hmm. you, that would totally happen. That would totally happen. That would be rad. <laughs> but if you would it got... wipe your phone every time you walked in the car because of the magnetic field? Um, <laughs> by that time we have this, we won't cards. need phones. We'll have Kirsten's brain chip to communicate. Oh. I do not want I everybody's want communications going through my brain. Why not? I want instant memory of things I didn't have to spend a lot of time I don't, doing. I don't really like the whole Google Glass thing. It's too much. I want to be able to put my phone away. It's nice. Wait, oh yeah, okay, I don't Lara. want it to be so intimate. Mm -hmm. I thought... I don't want to have to take my phone with me everywhere. This is yeah. terrible. People always with their phones and the computers and the thing in their hand. Why would so they you'd have rather this sort they of technology? look like they were listening to you, but they were actually browsing and you can't tell? How do you know they're not? Oh, that's going to be awful for classrooms. Yep. No, no, classrooms. That's what I'm saying. This will, people will get, I don't want to say the word, dumber. <laughs> they will get, no. they will lose Blair. This is a whole nother rant. I'm not even that's going what, there. That's what they said this about This is a rant. Television. This is a whole nother thing. Let's keep the phone would, separate from our brains, please. They said television would turn my brain to mush. Yeah, and it probably has. <laughs> that's time you'd be reading a book. 
<clears throat> no, it isn't. It's time. times I'd be throwing rocks at windows to see if they broke. Still, like you're doing really kinetic things to develop muscles and hand-eye coordination. Oh, yeah, I, I need hand-eye coordination. I, all I need to be able to do is type and do this. A study oh, recently suggests that one week of camping will reset your uh, circadian clock that living in the world of interior lighting, computer screens, phones, light constantly, artificial bluish light constantly hitting our eyes, uh, that our bodies are usually about two hours shifted off so that our, we're not in sync with our melatonin release. They, uh, studies have tracked people and their melatonin release related to their sleep cycles, and they find that usually when people get up in the morning, their melatonin is still fairly high, and it should be much lower. And so there's a mismatch in most people, and they found that camping for a week leads to about 400 times the exposure to sunlight than you get in an ordinary week and uh, that that led to people's <laughs> melatonin levels going back to normal and they were back in sync but just in time to go back to indoor lighting. My so. goodness, that's exactly what I was just talking about. Yep. It's along the same vein. So right along the same lines, I know. You're losing all this basal human stuff. Or we're getting, it's not that we're losing it, we're just becoming tweaked a little bit from it. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, how do, we, mm. how do we use our basal human stuff? How do we develop uh, t methods, behaviors to get our, keep ourselves in sync? The researchers suggest that um, you make a habit of getting up in the morning and going for a walk outdoors. Try and get exposure to s as much sunlight as possible. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. I, think, I think technology is fantastic and technology is vital to the way that we live today, but I think that you can embrace new technologies and have technology be an important part of your life without it replacing other important basal qualities that we need within our life that can be replaced by technology. Yeah. So, uh, Black European, I was texting when you said that. I didn't text. Go! <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. Um, dun, University dun, dun, of oh, wait, uh, University of Victoria. <laughs> Were you gonna University. say something? I was gonna dun 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 la, 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 end of the world stars. But okay, go for it. Dun 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 dun. dun la, 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 la. End of the world. And I want to get this in before <laughs> because hopefully we can have another story that finishes this quick deluge of stories that uh, doesn't leave us on the very brink of ending our time on the planet. Climate change occurring 10 times faster than at any time in the past 65 million years. <sighs> ah, yikes. Yeah, so that's uh, one story I should... Uh, this is uh, Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment uh, has analyzed this. Another story... Uh, finds climate strongly affects human conflict and violence worldwide. Shifts in climate are strongly linked to human violence worldwide, with even relatively minor departures from normal temperature or rainfall, substantially increasing risk of conflict in ancient times or today, according to a new study by researchers at the University of California, Berkeley, and Princeton University. Results, which cover all major regions of the world, and show similar patterns, whether looking at data from Brazil, China, Germany, Somalia, United States, published uh, today, August 1st, in Journal Science, by amassing more data than any prior study, the authors were able to show that the Earth's climate plays a more influential role in human affairs than previously thought. So climate change mm. equals violence and lots of destructive abilities. Mm. Hey. Mm. And, uh, oh, and uh, uh, also, it turns out there's uh, another discovery here. The biggest extinction in history, likely caused by a climate-changing meteor, but not the one that we thought had done it. Huh? So, yeah. So we, we were kind of familiar with the big one that hit uh, Mexico. Yes. Uh, Southern Mexico created the Gulf of Mexico, but evidence is accumulating that the biggest extinction of all was even further back... Oh, wait, no, this is a different extinction event, sorry. 252 million years ago at the end of the Permian period, also triggered by an impact that changed the climate. So not a different impact from that same impact, but a previous... This is a previous one. And uh, and in the happier news... In the happier news, please let there be happier news. Oh, 
Uh, we have uh, Ison coming. Ison? Comet Ison. Comet Ison, right. Comet Ooh. Ison. The it will not be hitting the Earth. <laughs> bestest observational, seeable, visible comet in a hundred years. Mm. Ooh, cool. It's on its way. Where is oh, wait, it visible no. and when? Yeah, see, uh, this, is, uh, this is what I'm trying to figure out here. Um, do, 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 do. ISON is named after the International Scientific Optical Network, the organization behind the comet's discovery, well, in September of 2012. The object belongs to a class called Sun Grazing Comets, which can skim the surface of the sun's atmosphere as they make their closest approaches. It remains difficult to predict exactly how bright the comet will become in November of this year. However, the potential exists for this to be one of the brightest comets of the past century. We encourage people to look up when it's there. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, closest approach to the sun will occur November 28th of this year. At cool. that point, the comet is exposed, expected to get as close to 800,000 miles from the sun's surface, which being that close, uh, you would expect, uh, if it's a big icy comet, We'll have a hell of a tail. Right. Mm. That's not, they don't, this researcher's going to say hell of a tail, but that's what I'm expecting. I would expect that too. Yeah. And hopefully, hopefully cool. it's not going through the, that region with all the, the rocks and the asteroids and doesn't bring a whole bunch oh, of yeah, pull a bunch of did stuff. You say, it. Did you say November 28th? Yes. Yep. That's Thanksgiving. Ah, so. Or the would United have States been. will be on holiday. Dun, 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 yeah, so after your dinner... Don't eat so much that you pass out. Yeah, go Stay look at the... Stay awake long lot. enough to watch ISON. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Earth, according to University of Victoria, is way more susceptible to a runaway greenhouse effect than we thought. Mm. Yeah, we have a delicate state of equilibrium and um, uh, basically runaway greenhouse effect once the sun enters late stages, increase in brightness and thermal activity will result in more trapped radiation and we'll have boiling and Venus-like planet and... Anyway, uh, researchers Tyler Robinson and Colin Goldblatt found a lower thermal radiation threshold for the runaway greenhouse, greenhouse process, um, suggesting that our atmosphere is not as uh, strong, mm -hmm. as robust as we thought it might be, which is very exciting. And it basically gives us a narrower habitable zone right. to exist within. Very right. Yes. Um, did I have more? I don't think I had more end of the world news. But I do have uh, stem cells and urine. Go. Oh, yeah. The story we were waiting for. So what you're going to tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me. I haven't read this. I don't know anything about this story. But please don't tell me that this is any sort of evidence for drinking urine as being a decent thing to do. No. Absolutely not. This is not what this is suggesting whatsoever. But uh, in the journal Stem Cells, team has uh, from Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center's Institute for Regenerative Medicine, they've found stem cells in the urine that can turn into multiple cell types. They can become all sorts of Amazing. things. Yeah, urine-derived cells can form bone, cartilage, fat, skeletal muscle, nerve, and endothelial cells for lining blood vessels, which means it would be kind of easy to get stem cells, multipotent stem cells, from your pee. And wow. it can be used for a lot of different therapies. Um, the, wow. the problem Hooray! With, hooray, right? Well, there are a few problems with urine-derived stem cells. Number one, um, they're in your urine, which while sterile when it is in your body and first leaves it, uh, if it's not collected correctly, there's the potential for bacterial growth, which could uh, cause uh, contamination of whatever sample you've got. Um, additionally, there are not a lot of these stem cells found in urine, but they're there. So, being able to get them to work is awesome. And the fact that they can do lots of things is doubly awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and then we go from there 
uh, with another study in which uh, researchers at the Chinese Academy of Sciences used urine-derived stem cells to make teeth. Amazing. Amazing. Wait, what, huh? And they urine grew teeth. urine teeth. <laughs> I were I lost my tooth, but you know, I just grew a new one. Where? Uh, I heard I about a solution teeth. on the internet. You ain't gonna like it though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah so fantastic. regenerate your teeth if you lose your teeth. Like there are a lot of people who have gum problems, tooth problems, tooth mm -hmm. decay. You know, why get fake teeth if you can grow your own? Totally. From your pee. I I see no issues with this whatsoever. That's why my cool. teeth are so yellow. <laughs> Ooh, that's why. Oh um, I have a quick yes. thing. Yes? Okay, so with the advent of digital cameras and each new generation of camera has more and more megapixels and they have all have macro settings now, the layman has started taking all of these amazingly awesome pictures specifically of teeny tiny animals including insects and because of the internet now there's a lot of citizen science going on with smartphones and digital cameras where they're actually adding to knowledge on species and their distribution and morphologies and all of this stuff is coming straight from the internet and anybody anybody with a camera can do it they have all these different websites now where you can submit your pictures such as Bug Guide and the Canadian Journal of Anthropo Anthropod Identification, the Encyclopedia of Life, the list goes on and on. As long as you give a, a picture location site and a date, that usually is enough for them to be able to narrow it down and add to a catalog and it can help all of our information about all of these animals that we don't know so much about yet. So I think that's awesome. Cool. That's the use of the internet and new technology that people are using to their advantage. They're not taking weird selfies in their bathroom photo, <laughs> bathroom mirror. They're taking a picture of a stick bug that we thought didn't exist somewhere. <laughs> that's awesome. So it's pretty cool. Citizen science. What, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all for me. Oh, I have. I like it. I like mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, oh yeah, if anyone decides that they want to put uh, the, put some activity into their lives, get into an ex exercise regime, according to a study published in PLOS Genetics, six months of exercise intervention causes epigenetic changes in DNA methylation in your fat tissue that leads to um, active reduction in uh, fat tissue and changes in fat metabolism. What? Yeah. Exercising changes the way your genes are expressed. So I can exercise for 30 days and then stop. But it probably, you could, you could do that. So these changes are, are the thing they don't know is exactly how long-lasting these changes are. So they just know that there are changes. Um, and, they, and they looked at uh, only after, before and after six mm -hmm. months of exercise. So who knows at what point the changes actually kick in. It could be at some point prior to six months. Mm -hmm. And from that point, they don't know how long the changes last. These are not permanent changes Great. in any regard. But No free fact, lunch. No free lunch, but you're, change, you're changing yourself. That's fantastic. I love that. Freaking awesome. Amazing. People talk about, you know, oh, you're going to, you know, change your metabolism. You start exercising. You're going to upregulate your metabolism, blah, 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 blah. You really are. You're... It, mm -hmm. There are genetic changes taking place. I love it. So cool. I love it. So cool. So cool. If you I if I upgraded my yourself. Yeah. If I upregulated my metabolism anymore, I would I would cease to be gaining nutrition from food. <laughs> I don't well, know what isn't would that a wonderful problem to have? Or, or I would have to oh, I would have to be nice. eating vats of sour cream, which I almost do already, just to keep up. Here's Justin, are you trying to get internet slapped? <laughs> <laughs> what? 
Okay, I have a I have a last story. I have last, a last story. story. This is actually a pretty wild one. Uh, okay, so this is this is a dopamine. Uh, it's a dopamine neuron study that reported to show that dopamine neurons are sensitive to the value of reward, but not to punishment. So it demonstrates that reward and, and adversiveness are re represented in two discrete dimensions or areas of the brain. Reward refers to the category of good things, food, water, sex, money, and punishment to the category of bad things, stimuli associated with harm to the body that cause pain through the unpleasant sensations or emotions. I love how they've written this. This is an analysis. The analyst who wrote this, this is the good things versus the bad things, and then parenthesizes and gives us an explanation of what bad things mean. Stimuli associated with harm to the body and that cause pain or other unpleasant sensations or emotions. <laughs> this is, so rather than having one neurotransmitter dopamine to represent single dimension of value, they, the present results imply the existence of four neurotransmitters to represent two dimensions of value, dopamine signals, evidence for reward, and, other, and some other neurotransmitter presumably signals uh, evidence against reward. Hmm. Likewise, there should be a neurotransmitter for evidence of danger and other things. But so this is kind of an interesting one. I mean, I guess it makes sense. It's just the dopamine being just the reward center, but it's not. I don't think what was expected. I, I thought there, the perhaps there was an expectation that it was giving a range of, of input on this, but it's just reward. Gives you reward. Gives you reward. And there's something else that's either got to counter that reward. Or to you know to say the negative. So it's not like the reward. It's not like your brain's reward system has a graded scale. It's well, just. Uh, it's reward or not. Yes, yes. But tempering that reward, there has to be something else. Well, it's understood that there are different receptors for dopamine. So you might have one particular neurotransmitter. Mm -hmm. Dopamine, but you have different kinds of receptors. So you can have various receptors that signal to do different things, but they respond to the same neurotransmitter, right? You can also have, um, if you don't have reward, so that might cause differences in the way that reward is signaled. But then if you don't have dopamine, then you don't have a reward. And the opposite would not necessarily be another neurotransmitter. Well, it, it could says, just be some. I mean, uh, they're saying that there probably is, but I'm just wondering. Huh? <laughs> well, I was just sort of picturing it as if you, for some reason, you didn't have uh, that. I mean, something that could allow dopamine to continue to be fired as a reward and have the rest of your neurons that are normally countering that with danger, hey, no, don't do the, too much risk for this behavior. You're, you're putting all of your money on, on 21 on the roulette wheel, and that's, that's not going to have a good pay. Like some other part of the brain not responding to it so that you continue gambling. And there was, there was, uh, there was a, uh, this odd side effect of... I think it was a Parkinson's medication. Yeah, L-Dopa. L-Dopa. That did just that. Causes it addiction. It causes it, it got, they've, if you start to have addictive uh, symptoms now, they just start reducing your L-Dopa so that uh, you don't have the, have the addictive consequences. But yeah, it can, there were a number of Parkinson's patients who suddenly had sex addictions, who had huh. gambling addictions, who had all sorts of things. Um, so you know, dopamine still negative. firing away, still giving a reward, but whatever is else is there that is tempering that mm -hmm. is been removed or silenced or short circuited or, or, or maybe or maybe there's a th maybe there's a threshold over which you know a certain amount of dopamine a certain amount of reward leads to uh, you know just a a silencing as a not opposed to an act I mean not an actual um, not an actual uh, opposite neurotransmitter. Because, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm just thinking of it 
in terms of what happens, you know, in my head. For exist, exist, example, while I'm flipping through Facebook or Twitter or whatever, and I'm like, oh, I should really be doing other things. Oh, that's a neat little picture. Oh, that's cool. You know, oh, I should really be doing other stuff. Why am I still doing this? Mm -hmm. I, should... <laughs> I should have been asleep an hour ago. I should have been asleep an hour ago. Oh, just out. But look at that. That's cute. Oh, they're doing that. That's awesome. Oh, look at um, that vine. <sighs> yeah, and um, actually, I read a really, really interesting piece in The Atlantic uh, yesterday by... Alexis Madrigal, and it's related to not dopamine per se, but the behavioral lever pressing that occurs uh, when we're doing things that our um, uh, doing things that are potentially addictive. So gambling, for instance, or flipping through Facebook, through our social media networks. And what he went on to say is that specifically an example from uh, research looking at gambling has found that uh, machines, gambling machines, are being designed so that they give unpredictable rewards, that reward being some kind of little, little tiny payout. And so eventually you're gambling and you continue to gamble not because you're going for that big reward and not because you feel like, oh, I'm going to get that big reward. It's just the possibility, the unpredictableness of something interesting happening that keeps you tied in there. And he, and Alexis was suggesting in his article that something very similar happens in Facebook or Instagram mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. these other that social sites where you're just flipping through and every once in a while just something neat pops up and oh that's cool, oh that's what my friend's doing and you make some kind of a connection and it's mm -hmm. just enough of a positive reinforcement to keep you going. That makes it's, perfect sense. And so it's just enough, what I would think is that it would be just enough to release more dopamine and keep you going. Release more dopamine. And it's just, instead of letting it just slowly taper off, because you're not getting really any feedback or anything from what you're looking at, that little tiny, ooh, that was interesting, ooh, okay. And it's not regular and it's not predictable, so your brain doesn't get habituated to it. So I'm wondering if there's some kind of mix of like predictability or unpredictability, n not habituating, uh, release some uh, not regular release of dopamine into the brain that might be involved. I don't know. I just took that off on a tangent. Sorry. No, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> dopamine. Maybe we should come up with something to counter dopamine, right? <laughs> More dopamine. More Fight dopamine. Fight dopamine with dopamine. Well, it's kind of like that, I don't know, I was told when I was a teenager, one of the reasons they tell you never to take ecstasy is that normal life is never as good because you have the extreme... That's not See, this is what I was told when I was a teenager. Is that of course that's what they tell you. Right, right, right. I'm just saying what they tell you when you have a teenager is because it increases the amount of dopamine that... Yeah and serotonin, right, is that it um, It basically has this like pleasure overload and now your idea of what pleasure is is higher than what is the normal amount. Which I'm sure is, there's no science in that. But I'm You'll saying that's... you be happy again. Exactly. That's, that's <laughs> what they try to say is whatever used to be pleasurable to you in, the, in real life, once you add that excess of the feel-good hormones, mm -hmm the normal amount isn't good enough. So I was just thinking about that because you are saying more yeah. dopamine on top of the dopamine makes normal amounts of dopamine not interesting. Right. More dopamine. So, that, by the way, that is the worst advice if anybody out there is ever considering giving that advice to a child <laughs> or a teenager. It the last thing me. You... It scared me. Really? <laughs> wow. It would not have worked on me. It would have yeah. sounded like this to me. This drug is so freaking awesome that, like, compared to doing this drug, everything else is just so lame. No, you this, you haven't even experienced actual experience. See, of I enjoyment. guess that's just the type of person that you are versus the type of person that me that I am. Because I got terrified and went, "Dear God, I want to be able to enjoy real life. 
I like real life. I want to keep liking real life. That's the most terrifying thing to me in the world. So what we need to what we what we're learning from this is that different psychological profiles respond better to different kinds of anti-drug messages and that a (laughs) one-size-fits-all messaging system doesn't work. I'm shocked. Right? Shocking. I'm shocked. Yeah, shocking. And I and and I'm I will say that there are probably a percentage of people out there for whom you know that that might happen where they have such an addictive personality that their brains are tuned to kind of to go that direction whereas the majority of people are probably not do not probably have the same brain wiring and that's not right. going to happen. Right, right. But definitely. You know, yeah, you know, scientifically, there's no one size fits all for the brain, so there should not be one size fits all for how we tell people about drugs and right. the problems that can come out of them. And I by mean, the way, concern it. If spiders have separate personalities, <laughs> obviously, right. obviously our brains are different. If their brains work differently, our brains work differently. Come on! <laughs> yeah. Oh, and if anyone out there is thinking of trying methamphetamines, meth, um, it's been found that crystal meth users have a higher incidence of bacterial heart infections. Crystal Whoa. meth makes it much more likely that um, some pretty awful bacteria will infect your heart. Just add that to the laundry just list, just man. Add that right in there. Yeah. Just, just so you know. Yeah, that is about as wicked a drug as you can get without straight up huffing, <laughs> huffing is, yeah. Scotch Garden insecticide. <laughs> it's pretty much, it's, yeah, it's, it's about as toxic Avenger as you can get. Okay. Yeah, toxic Avenger. Check. Toxic Won't Avenger? do meth. Thanks, guys. You're welcome. Yeah. Are you afraid but the of that person one now, too? You would never enjoy anything after you've done ecstasy was totally lying to you. <laughs> <laughs> Disclaimer. Just, Just, what? <laughs> what? I'm not talking about. <laughs> Let me stay in my happy place. Yes. No, no. Don't leave. By all means. We like it's not as happy things. as it could be. But <laughs> <laughs> It's happy enough. I don't know if it's we can handle it. It's happy, happy enough, as long as you're happy with it. As long I as you're satisfied anymore. with your current level of happiness, mm-hmm. then you should stay there. You know what? I am what so do? happy because I got to do this show on my birthday and hang out with Yay. some really awesome people. And, yeah, celebrate my birthday in a sciency way. It was yeah. awesome. It was so awesome. I'm very happy. That and the wine. It's great. That all helps. <laughs> it all helps. Everybody, this is This Week in Science. We have completed another show, and we will be back here next Thursday evening to do another one, and we hope that you'll, you'll join us here on Google Plus and YouTube, our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash This Week in Science. Look for um, feeds, and we'll be right in there with the live episode if you want to catch it. Otherwise... Most re- recent episode to be watched on our YouTube page. Oh wait, that's is that my cue? Am I? Yes. I have words. I have words now. Thanks everyone for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google "This Week in Science" in your iTunes directory, or if you have an Android device, you can look for "Twist for Droid" in the Android marketplace. And if you have an iPhone, we are simply. Twist, T-W-I-S, in the iPhone market thingy. Yes, and for more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website, www.twist.org. We also want to hear from you, so email us at kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, justin at thisweekinscience.com, or blairbaz at twist.org. You can also be, be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in that subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also contact us on the Twitter, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, or at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there is a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, please let us know. 
We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for some more great science news. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember... It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science is the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop. Got my banner unfurled. It says the silent voice is in. I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robot with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer, and it shouldn't be new. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just better understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. Jeopardy. This week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our methods that are rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Got the eye Cause it's this week in science 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 of items I want to address, from stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness. I'm trying to promote more rational thought, and I'll try to answer any question you got. So how can I ever see the changes I seek, when I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way. You better just listen to what we say. And if you learn anything from the words that we said, then please just remember it's all in your head. Because it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in 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 science. I liked your spider dance player. Thanks. That was awesome. No, I'm a chicken. Chickens. <laughs> I love chickens. They make the best sound. Cucuricu. Cucuricu. Awesome show, everybody. 
Thanks everybody for hanging out and watching the show and thanks Blair for being a unicorn. <laughs> What's going on, Justin? You got to run. I gotta go. Okay. Yeah, I That's go. the split. So okay. have That's fun. Cool. That's cool. Enjoy. It's cool, man. It's See cool. You next week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. I think I had... no, that was it. There was nothing else. There was something I really wanted to talk about, and I can't remember what it was. It was just something quick. Phooey. P h o o e y. It was so Ooh. quick, too. I just wanted to, like, quickly mention something. I have no idea what it was. Mm, an event. An aquarium. An, an, about. Yeah, an event. No. A haiku that came to you in the night. A suggestion uh, for a future. Mm. Mm. Shucks. I don't recall. I don't know either. I don't recall. It, were you going to tell me when you were finally coming home? Anything. Stop! Enough! <laughs> <laughs> After our conversation last week, never. I missed it. I oh, need to no. watch last week. Oh, no. Uh, the show went very long last week. Well, the actual no, show saw, was... Exact, I saw you okay, post so something about how long The exact that show went. lasted like an hour and two minutes. It was like we perfect. Were like right on time. Perfect. But the after show may have lasted three hours. <laughs> it could have been a little bit longer than the show. <laughs> I wanted to go home after ten minutes. Let Did the you record really? state. You could have left that just a second. I'm I gotta polite. Go. I'm a polite. Don't be polite. Person. Why be polite? See, I'm a polite person too. I'm like, oh, I'll stay around. Did you go? Did you guys fight around about um, Jerusalem or something? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, about Egypt. Uh, yeah. Egypt, huh? Mm. Mm -hmm. About the origin story, my people. No big deal. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, no. It's on public <laughs> record that there was a debate. <laughs> to be fair. To be How fair. How can I scrub this? <laughs> no, you should start, probably remove the antithesis. Before we start though. again. Oh, yeah. Hour. I was going to send you an email about that. You should probably think, keep the tight hour. I think you should <laughs> compare that to... People's problem with evolution, because I think there's something. Oh, like, don't you do yeah. that! Don't I'm you sorry. Do that. <laughs> don't, to, that was like I a stab to. to my heart. Well, don't let it be, because that may be what pe oh, it feels God. like. No, listen. No, listen. Make it an appreciation for how people are reacting right. to the basic science of evolution. I think that's really important. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I've tried to play around with this in creating one of these scenarios myself for having a faith-based belief that there would never be a Higgs boson <laughs> and, and tried to go through a few stages of denial that it even existed, right? But it, uh, which is fun, but I, that's how I would put it, and I will leave it there, and I will not bring the subject up with you again. Hooray! <laughs> I, can, I can appreciate the need for trying to cultivate an understanding of other people's sides of, yeah. uh, you know, of a, of a discussion, of a controversial I'm topic, horrible at doing some, it. of I, a debate. It's, it's, it's very important. It's very important. It's very hard to put yourself in the position into somebody else's shoes and to yeah. feel how they're feeling to understand why they respond the way that they do. Um, it's not quite the same as the way you were poking at Blair, but no, um, but it is a unique a opportunity comment. to to, right. to see it from that side, which I'm I'm actually incapable of doing. I don't have a vested interest in any background of a peoples or a culture or anything. Yeah, I don't have a religion. I was never. It's not like I discovered science and my uh, my illusions of religion dissipated, and I was challenged by faith. I never had it. I've never been anything but an atheist since the day I was born. So I have no idea when I'm having this is a, he doesn't this is a conversation know, he, I think he we got into it. You're stepping on people's toes. You don't right. know when and you're got, offending them. Exactly. You don't understand where the boundaries are. Exactly. And yeah. And I and But I'm it, also saying it's different growing up an atheist where you're if there was a religion that would be dominant within your household growing up was the one that was the majority and was comfortable. But it was there wasn't in my household. The, but the, there was. We talked about this last time. But it was the grandparents. It was the, the grandparents. It wasn't my household. There were the household. grandparents, but also yeah. there were the uh, holidays that you got off. 
from yeah. school. Right. Sure, sure, there, there were, were things, the but they questions. Were also... Nobody asked you about questions about your family where no. they couldn't understand anything about you. Okay? Absolutely. I'm just it saying did. it was Absolutely. a different place wait, wait, to come Blair, from. Blair, I'm going to stop you there for a sec because I have to say that's not true because having friends who were Christians growing up. Now, understandably, we all celebrated Christmas, but it was different than the way we celebrated Thanksgiving because there was nothing in the Thanksgiving story or Halloween, for instance, that made me go, sheesh, ignore the fact that every song is religious and about God around Christmas. I had to do that. Any, I mean, I had to do that every Christmas. I, to this day, mm -hmm. I have to enjoy Christmas despite the constant religious overtones of the holiday. I mean, I'm, I'm not coming from a tradition where that was normal and I walked away from it. I'm coming from never having bought into that, having not that ever been taught within the household and reinforced in the household. So it, I, in, in that sense, I can appreciate the Jewish perception of Christmas because all this the mm. gospel I don't think it's singing, the same. I don't think it's the same at all. I so I, I would say I would draw a parallel. Let me draw a parallel for you. When yeah. I lived in Israel, Thanksgiving came around. Okay? And I wanted to celebrate Thanksgiving. And nobody, nobody knew what Thanksgiving meant. Yeah. Nobody knew what day of the week it was. And when I wanted to have a special meal for it, it was followed by incessant questions. And yeah. keep in mind, this is all based on a holiday. It has some pretty ominous undertones when you look at it closely. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. So this is something that we sell, still celebrate all over America. Everyone knows what Thanksgiving is. Not all yes. over America. Native Nation yeah. does not celebrate Thanksgiving. Okay, anyway. <laughs> right? Please, it's, it's, it's an American oh, holiday. We are taking over the continent. Ooh. And everybody celebrates. Everyone knows what day it is. Everyone understands what it is. Right? So then when I go to Israel, suddenly I'm this, I have to explain to every single person that I meet about oh, yeah. it. Yeah, we killed a bunch of Indians and <laughs> we so celebrate imagine that. <laughs> Every holiday that you celebrate is like that. Mm -hmm. And everything that makes your um, traditions within your family special to you is like that. Right. So That's I'm what I'm saying. And, and, and I don't know if you, you experienced different. this the same or not, but I mean, I, I recall, you know, because you're, you're dealing with eight year olds or 10 year olds or 12 year olds or whatever the age is growing up when they find out that you don't believe in God, right, are, are then delivering to you religion as is understood by an 8, 10, or 12-year-old. And it basically comes down to that means you're going to hell, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I remember having these conversations with my friends who, who believed in God and believed that God was active and around and stuff. And I'm like, okay, we go to this, we're best friends. We go to the same school. We're in the same class. We spend all day together. After school, we play for a good three hours every day. We hang out. Then you go home and eat dinner. Or sometimes I even eat dinner there, and I, God's presence isn't seeming to be in the room. So then is it sometime after you go to bed? Is it only on Sunday? Is it only in church? Like It was like this fascinating, bizarre thing to me. I couldn't figure out how they could be believing in something. When I'm with them, I'm around them all the time, and I'm not experiencing this sensation, this feeling, this thing they're talking about. And and it was, it is, when, I mean, it's much more acceptable, I would say. Much more acceptable in society a Christian-dominated society to be Jewish than it is to be an atheist. Okay, how about being a Jewish atheist? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I am. There well, you but, go. But pretty much if you're Jewish, you're an atheist anyway. But at least it... <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> right? Not really. That's not coming Whoa. from me. No, that's, that's me making fun of the other perspective. You have to understand when I'm not Joking. speaking from my own perspective of... Right. right. Because no, I, I <laughs> but I think I think we can both appreciate living in a Christian dominated society. But I I think what 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 I've got is a little bit of a different takeaway as coming from an atheistic perspective in a religiously dominated society. So that even even the groups of people who aren't down with Christmas then it turns out they're still not atheists. They still have other stuff that they do that you don't get. That that's ah, oh, it's like I didn't have Hanukkah. I would have loved so, Hanukkah. That'd so been awesome. This, so this, you know, as as 
as we're going into it, I mean, the, the reason that you bring it up and that you're talking about it is, you, you know, you say that it's to understand other people's perspectives so that we can get an idea of how people who come from a different background, from a religious perspective that does not take evolution um, into uh, into consideration, that actually looks at evolution as something, or even climate science for that exam for for that matter, as something oh, that yeah, challenges that. the dogma of that they've grown up with. Um, you know, if you can start to understand that, maybe you can start to have a conversation. But it, you know, it's not going to be the same as you know this conversation that you're having with Blair. It's not going to be the same as what you're having. I mean, every well, every situation is going to be its sure. own, have its own. Sure, but I, I think this was a great example of it. I think this was a great example of it. I think Blair should not change her mind about anything, but appreciate her reaction to the argument I was making. Yeah, as there as why she. Is why she and and I would say that as much of a connection as she has to that start, or maybe you could answer this, but I would assume that it's possible to have when you're talking about something that is a, a cornerstone belief that somebody has in their religious story, it's gonna feel like the same sort of attack as what I was making on your belief system there. So that's that's important, and that was a that was. I think you have a bigger takeaway from that than I do. My takeaway is just not to talk to Blair about it, but I could give a damn about the next person who has a religious belief <laughs> or cultural belief that I talk to. I feel bad because I don't want to upset Blair, but uh, the next person I talk to, I'm going to come from, I, I would actually, I believe, was, was being much less jugular than I normally am in such conversations. Well, something that I, I found uh, that I read recently that was interesting was, you know, not the kind of conversation you guys were having, but um, a, a geeky scientist was writing about um, how how her, and this isn't necessarily about just evolution, but how she's you know, not into fashion. She's just, she likes her science. She likes talking about science. And when something cool comes up, she wants to tell her friends. But a lot of her friends are like super into fashion and looking cute. And they, you know, they look at the fashion magazines and they talk about the newest clothes. And, and, and so something happened and she, there were, she was like, okay, well, I got to get dressed up and I have to get into the fashion thing and I and try and learn about it. And she could not get excited about it at all. She tried. She tried looking at the fashion magazines. She tried having conversations with her friends and she couldn't get excited about it at all. And she stopped for a second. She's like, oh, this is what it must be like for my friends when I talk about science. Like they just aren't connected to it in any way and they just cannot get excited about it mm -hmm. you know so there are just some people who have interests there are some people who don't have interests in certain things and then and then there's the belief level which is even more complicated beyond that communication is hard mm -hmm. it's hard to talk to a lot of different people and there's a lot of different people in this world <laughs> science <laughs> Science yeah, well, should not be dividing. Science no, should science, bring people together, yeah, absolutely. right? But, but you know, the just for the record, the other side has had thousands and thousands of years of killing uh, people who brought up scientific uh, scientific truths that challenged religious dogma. Um, thousands of years. You know, we, we, we all know the story of Galileo being brought before the Inquisition and recanting his life's work, basically yeah. saying, yes, the earth is the center of the universe, and what I was saying was heresy. What we forget was this wasn't a, uh, getting aligned with any sort of religious belief that he had. It was absolute abject fear of the Inquisition because I think six years earlier, six or 16 years earlier, Giordano Bruno, who was saying the same thing based on Copernicus, refused to recant. And when he was being sentenced to death, said, you, uh, you have much more to fear in this than I do, knowing that if you're basing your entire religion, and he had been a friar at one point, if you're basing your entire religion 
on the idea that the Earth is the center of the universe, you have much more to fear than I, because the truth is basically the truth will not go away, right? Yeah. They he refused to recant in, in the Inquisition. Was uh, had a written death sentence uh, signed by the Pope at the time. It wasn't sufficient for them to simply murder him, but they hung him naked upside down in the town square, drove an iron spike through his tongue, and set him on fire. You think they were trying to send a message? Yes, and Galileo got the message. Okay, He recanted, and we stayed dark AG for a lot longer. So I, when, I have, when I speak benevolently and jugularly about these things, I'm doing it from... The fact that this is really the first time, truly the first time, the last several decades, ultimately, with the exception perhaps much of the founding fathers and how this nation became the first nation on the planet to have a separation between church and state and to remove religion from our government. Mm. This country and then this time now in our country where we're sufficiently progressive enough to be allowed to have these conversations, I am pulling no punches. <laughs> the, time is, the time has come for no, no, no more of this. There, I'm not going to get hung upside down in town square and set on fire. Other people were. It's time to talk. <laughs> it's time to say things how they really are and have no fear. Right, so I would like to see your science. That's all I'm saying. That is all I've ever said about this, is that there has been an oral tradition, and I believe this thing, and there is no science yet to indicate either way, in any way, that is enough for me. Because I have found plenty of scriptures from Egypt that have talked about the Judeans that were slaves. And you say you haven't found any yet, and that's fine. But I found some. If and so uh, I don't the, have enough I evidence in front of me for evidence. my mind. Yeah, if it's Josephus or whatever evidence. his name is, uh, uh, Josephus, I think it is, it was turned out to be a uh, false. Yeah, well. <laughs> but, but I don't know which ones you're, you're actually using. But I also, I mean, I, you could point to all sorts of things historically, too. I mean, I don't want to get into it, but if it, there's, a, there's a, if you look at, and I guess I guess we're not talking about the religion, so I guess I can't bring up Moses having had his entire story having been lifted from right. thousands so of years. So they have old. found so that, that Moses was a man named Moshe, which meant from the river, but it also meant son of the king. It meant prince in um, the ancient Egyptian scrolls where they found him. So just like Jesus was a real person, as far as they can tell, Moshe, Moses, was someone in Egypt around that time. I, I don't know who is claiming in this day and age that they can prove Jesus was a real person, but they there is no They can definitely prove people. that Jesus was a real person. There have been archaeological no. finds that Absolutely suggest... Absolutely untrue. That, we're gonna have to go. We'll have to do a show. On there, this. We okay. Do a twist so it looks like there was definitely I think, a guy I think it's very that was a rabbi that was called known. Jesus. He wasn't called Jesus Christ from as far as they could tell, because Christ is a whole other thing. But okay. there was definitely a guy named Jesus, and there have been lots so, of books published based on mm -hmm. scientific research and anthropological research that indicate that there was a guy that fit that description. Okay, yeah. I'm not saying that there was no that the name Jesus didn't exist back then, but what I would strongly argue uh, is that everything about the story of Jesus. Yeah, I mean, these, I mean, it just seems an odd coincidence. I mean, and I know we're not taking miracles literally or anything else, but when you read the scripture and the sources, first of all, they're coming from hundreds and hundreds of years later. In some cases, as much as like 500 years later, uh, but Take Horus, for example, the sun god of Egypt from 3,000 years before Christ. Or the time is... Okay, Horus is born to a virgin mother. And when he is born, the eastern star is in the sky. He is a, he's referred to as a shepherd. He actually carries a big shepherdy stick thing, whatever that's called, right? Shepherd's staff. He actually carries that in all the images of him. He walked on water. He traveled around. He he healed people. He died and ascended to heaven. He was he was not just 
the son of God. He was the son God. Now, this might seem like we're just playing a literary trick here, but um, he there also... Have been, this is, there have been like ten stories in history, at least, where yeah. what essentially is the Jesus story happened. I understand that. That's never what I was saying. Sure, sure. But okay. then where do we separate? I mean... Because it's, of, it's a game of telephone. It's the a game temple of, of Nazareth wasn't there. There could be this be much of a grain of truth that there was this guy that said some cool stuff about mm -hmm. love thy neighbor, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Then it turned into, oh, he also helped these people right. um, cure themselves from this horrible disease sure. by helping them raise their spirits. And then, oh, actually, he cured their illness. They were lepers. And then all of a sudden, oh, he turned water into wine. And then over time, it turns into this whole thing. I'm not saying any of those things are correct. I'm saying that there was a guy that fit that description, that had some teachings that followed along with this. And over time, it turned into a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. Which happens over time, and 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 none of it, none of it matters to any what to me really what any people said just because it was in ancient timings. I guarantee you, all three of us sitting here are better read than anybody who did any of the writing of that time. I bet any of us would have a much better grasp on historical record if we had been the ones collecting it than anybody who is purported to have put these books together that are reporting what they was being. I mean, the fact that you could write a book or they put something in writing and then only some people were actually had the ability to read was such a powerful force in the ancient world. And now literacy that is, is, is available to anyone with a you know, fourth grade education. So, I mean, that's why these stories, too. I mean, this is, this is why there's so many parallels in these stories from ancient, more ancient stories, they lifted them. And the way they got away with lifting them, plagiarizing them, taking the Ten Commandments almost word for word from ancient Egyptian sayings is by the fact that nobody could read. Nobody knew that they had stolen the story. If, if I were to tell you a story that you all knew, I mean, if, if, I, if, all, if you two were complete illiterates, you were never read, never had much outside of your language that had been translated even, uh, perhaps, then I could bring you the works of Shakespeare and I could claim them as my own and you would be amazed at my abilities to put words together and tell stories. It wouldn't occur to you, nor did it to those people, that anything written like this, any story this elaborate, any of these tales, could be untrue. But that doesn't add any weight or significance to anything that is written in any of these ancient texts, and all of them should be taken as a writer who wrote them, or many, many writers who wrote them as collaborative work, all of whom were less well-read than the three of us, all of whom were less educated than the three of us, all of whom were, had less vision of the depth of history than the three of us. And, and if you put it in perspective, would you, I mean, if you were to take a remote Afghani sheep herder who had some vision of anything and presented that to us, we would not take his accounting of the history of mankind as anything that we could base our, our actual beliefs on. It would just be incomprehensible. And I think that's what took place in the fact that it was in writing and really, I mean, the biggest thing that ever happened to Christianity is Constantine and getting it into the Roman Empire and having it be the symbol of conquest and conquering and war. I think what I think what's the important thing here, though, is what we've what has been said is that there's, you know, there's a lot of parable, there's a lot of story and what we do here is something that we need to stay consistent with, with, which is trying to take things based on evidence and what we know. So we can go from the story and go, okay, this is the story. What is the evidence? What is the actual, what is actually known? Which is what Blair is talking about. And then what is also important is maintaining that so that you know, discussions that we have on all sorts of things that come from a fact-based, evidence-based place. So it's like I was talking about last week, I was bringing back over and over again to this man-pig hybrid nonsense, right? right. We have this nonsense <laughs> oh story, 
Okay. Now, Holy last week, nonsense. Kiki and I talked about they published on Fizzorg a article about how people were not giving it its proper scientific due, and what? people were judging it inappropriately. And at first, what? I thought it was ridiculous. I thought it was ridiculous. But then I read the article, and basically, all the article was saying was, "Yeah, we know this guy's probably crazy." Hold on. Go, Sonny. Go. They said, we know this guy's probably crazy. We know there's probably no way that humans and pigs came, or that humans came from a chimp pig hybrid, but we owe him, since he published a scientific document, to do some proper peer review. Just do the DNA analysis and throw it out. Take the time, right? So to a certain extent, I think it is hard to address every silly notion brought to the scientific community, but the only weapons we have are the science. Right. It's true. And so if you can take the time to do the DNA research to show actually, no, the DNA doesn't hold up. Sorry. Right? One of the and cool, you can get rid of it. Yeah. One of the cool things about uh, the web and a lot of, you know, the the blogging and scientific writing that's going on right now is um, the fact that there are people who have backgrounds in all sorts of areas who are writing about stuff and who are fact-checking things. And so there was recently an article that appeared on, I don't remember what it was, but it's some, you know, popular site. It was a top 10 terrible things that are in America, in American food that are banned elsewhere in the world. And uh, it was this list of things that you, you read if you know anything about it, you go, oh, it's, oh my God, that's so silly. And, but people who don't know, they're like, oh my God, this is in this, and oh my gosh, this is in this, and oh, and suddenly people are freaking out about things in their food. And so a, num a couple of very, very good chemists went through and did reviews point by point on the ingredients, on the list, and said, well, this is real, this is not, this is real, this is not, this is the evidence, this is what the facts are as we know them, and basically showed the entire thing to be, to be bunk. And I mean, and that's the kind of thing that, you know, I took that and was like, okay, share, and was sharing the response to that article, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that, you know, that can at least, I can at least help get that out right. into, into more people's heads. Right. And so, I mean, if you look back in time, we thought the Earth was flat. Someone drove, uh, sailed a ship over what was supposed to be the end of the Earth, went around, right? People have been proving these silly misconceptions wrong over and over and over again. And that's how we do it. That's how we get past these misconceptions. Just like a lot of the evolutionary debate has been proved through science. You can see the DNA analysis, you can see the morphological comparisons, you can see it happen in real time with bacteria and fruit yes. flies. And okay, that just so proves how brilliant the creator was in creating a system that could self-sustain itself and adjust to... This is, the arguments no, don't cease there, this that, is what I'm saying. That's but that why has I'm, nothing... I mean, that in itself doesn't really... the whole... when it gets to okay, the creator developing a system, it's like, great, the creator developed a system. Awesome. We have this system. It's what we call evolution. And evolution is the science that we teach in the schools. And so we're going to teach the system as we know it in the schools. We're not going to teach that some thing out there created it because science cannot show that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So we do not talk about that in the science classrooms. We do not nor, talk nor, about that in the science conversations. That can be discussed in a religious discussion elsewhere. Nor do we take half the time of people your astronomy are about class I want evolution and start to talk about astrology in the science nor classrooms. Take half of the chemistry class and talk about alchemy. <laughs> it doesn't belong there. Historically, it you can talk about the history of chemistry, and you can say, okay, this is what people used to think, but this is what we know now through science as to what works. These are the chemical bonds. This is what we've shown through uh, some really amazing um, some electron electron scanning micrographs, where you know very high resolution images. We're starting to see that what we know, what we thought was. What an, what an atom looked like is what an atom looks like. You know, there are all sorts of things that we're starting to show that we can actually really, that there's stuff that's 
really proving what the theory has been. That right. And as the amount of evidence uh, increases for these things, so decreases the arguments, not decreases the number of arguments against, but de uh, the, de the, the arguments against that, or in favor of a divine creator or what have you, find new territory or are willing to sacrifice part of the story. Okay, but that's not part so that's of not even the, what we're talking about. That's Deniers not what we're talking about. What we're talking about. What I'm oh. saying is we thought for decades, if not over a hundred years potentially, that uh -huh. we came out of Africa. Okay? Mm -hmm. And we all assumed that based on what we were the resources that we were given. It was not until we got new resources that we started to think, hmm, it's looking like maybe we came out of Asia. This is all very recent, right? So I'm saying all of right. my teachings and all of my evidence that has been handed to me over my lifetime has indicated to me that my ancestors were slaves in Egypt. Once I get some other evidence that indicates right. they weren't or that they were somewhere else in that period of time, I will be happy to look at it. But as long as your argument is that you can't explain how it happened or that you don't have evidence for it right now that is not information enough for me no and i understand but this is the, a, and we I, don't wait, need wait, to wait, taunt wait. people ba and we don't need to taunt people related to religion because that's not what the important thing is yeah it has right. nothing to do with it but at all it has nothing to do with it but what we what but i do what I, agree with you my, about wait, justin this is the point i was leading up to earlier just just earlier just earlier and this is a lot Last thing I'll say, because I really have to go. But, I was um, going to say I gr agreed with you about something. Oh, well, that, that, that's, that's normal now. That's, that's, <laughs> no, come on, don't act like that's so strange. <laughs> but the, the one I was pointing to is like how the arguments against the change are in favor of the creator change, and they change the location and things. In, in your story, it's 600,000 families that leave Egypt. Okay? That is just yeah, basic math. Yeah, and the Bible also says the earth was created in seven days. I, okay, but see, exactly. Right? I'm saying so the, the we specific replaced... details aren't what's important to me, and this is what I was talking to you about before. It's not who cares if it was 600,000 or if it was 5,000. I don't really care. If it was the right. foundation of my people, that's all I care about. There was an the event in the story that five five led people? to... It's a, a story it's a, everything's a story. People. Everything's storytelling. Humans it's respond tradition. to it's telling. It's not a hundred percent. There's no oh. way it's a hundred percent. Even if they were trying to be the perfect history keepers in the entire history of the world, because they only had oral tradition, there is no way it's accurate. And I'm it's aware of that. There is no it, possible way it's it accurate. Interesting, isn't it, that the the story was existed in Israel to the north, but not Judah to the south, which would have had the closer connection to Egypt that had the, the border of Egypt. So Judah I mean, is what depending on how you define Judah the Judean desert is in Israel. Yeah no but there were two tribes there was the the kingdom of there Judah There were 12 tribes. Well but these are these are the, uh, the at the time of this story there was the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel and Israel to the north uh, there was the story of the 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 leaving Egypt. And to the south, there was no such story. There was no such tradition, written or oral or anything. And it didn't begin to show up until the Syrians invaded Israel. And, and I think Judah actually had Jerusalem at that time. Um, invaded the Israel, Israel tribe, and they had to take refuge in Judah, which, again, I do recognize... How important that that oral traditional story must have been, even in the kingdom of Judah, for them to preserve. No, I totally agree. And for a peoples who, I what, mean, what have I, been constantly having to be. What I appreciate you know, here on the tree of other societies with other. Like what I appreciate <laughs> here is the uh, the fact that there are two different realities here. That Justin has a story that he has put together that he believes to be true and Blair has a story that she has grown up with that is you know the basis for for her belief and her the historical tradition of of your religion and it it just goes to show that there are different pieces of evidence depending on what you read who you listen to that will go to get go into creating the story that you make up in your head the story that you go by and that conversations need to be had that are not 
uh, confrontational and that people can so that people can share information and try and learn how to get to the root of what the true story really is you know can we get to the basis of everything and what I was going to agree with you about Justin is the fact that we need to be speaking out I don't think we need to do it in a Richard Dawkins ish confrontational kind of manner telling people that they're you know idiots for not being atheists whatever I mean that to me is not the right way to go about it because I don't even know that he's right. I, I don't know that atheism is right. You don't know that atheism is right. I don't think he but calls people do know, atheists, but Oh, I, I think he does. Sure. <laughs> but, but basically, we need, we need to, in this day and age, as you say, our dem democratic system was based on the idea of an educated populace, people who could make decisions, who could vote in an intelligent way, in an educated way to be able to create a government of representation and what we have now is leading away from that system and so I think everyone needs to speak out about things that they know about and try and get people interested enough not to bash them with your ideas so that you're like I'm right and this is the only way but get them interested in asking questions and trying to figure things out for themselves because that is the only way that this whole country that our world is going to move forward in a positive way so there yeah the end yep. <laughs> next week Next week I go back further. Next week's after show, I promise I will give you the origin of God itself. Not oh, religion. Okay. Not religion, but the origin of God. I got it all figured out. We can talk yeah. about it next week. Okay. You've been talking and to I'm Joseph Campbell. I'm going to talk Campbell, about hmm? spontaneous generation in a laboratory. How about that? I'm going to well, write I that like down. That. I like that. Spontaneous. Because I'll talk about the science part. Science! <laughs> 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 you Bye. guys are too awesome. Oh, Everyone's too awesome. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Have a wonderful <laughs> evening, Justin. Love you, Blair. Love you, Kiki. Bye. I love Bye. you. <laughs> I really do. I really do. I. Justin has always pushed my oh, buttons, okay. but it's always in a way that makes me go, oh, I'll, I'll think about that. So. Yeah. It's good to see someone else's buttons pushed, huh? <sighs> Yeah, <laughs> it's not just You're mine. You're like, oh, that's what that looks like. Hmm, oh, oh. Hmm. that's not just oh, me. She looks pretty mad. Yeah. <laughs> we really, really do need to create the automatic shin kicker so yes. that we both have the button. Here we go. I would really appreciate that. <laughs> Mainly because we just now had the same, at least hour-long conversation four times. I'm like, yeah. Justin, we don't we'll need to do this. it again. We don't need to do this it's again. It's enough. <gasps> Done. Shoo. Shoo. Let's just be productive. Productive and get people to be curious. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Right. yep, 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 yep. Well, what are you going to go do for your birthday now? Today I got to go birding, which is <gasps> awesome. Fun. Where? In oh, the, the North Bay? No, in San Francisco, there's a, oh, what's it called? It's over in the Presidio. There's this little valley. It's really tiny, and it's I, near some barracks, and I had no idea where we were going, and I don't, I don't remember what it's called right now. It starts with a P, I think. Um, but uh, Native Indians and Spaniards lived there when the area was first settled because there is a natural spring there. And so it's been preserved, and they've recently tried to uh, do some um, fixing of the habitat to try and make it more like it used to be. And there's like, it seems very sand duny, and there's uh, interesting areas within this really small space. So you've got like the riparian, um, riparian area with uh, little ponds, and then you've got the spring, and you've got some a bunch of different. Um, uh, different wood, different uh, deciduous trees, and then you've got the area with the conifers and eucalyptus. So there's the taller trees, and so we saw a sharp-shinned hawk, we saw a red-tailed hawk, we saw um, song sparrows. I saw um, 
I saw a Hutton's Vireo. I saw, I believe it was, a, I think it was a fly catcher, but I'm not exactly sure. I saw a couple of hummingbirds. I saw morning doves, finches. So many birds. It was great. It was amazing. There was this one little area of shrubbery, and it's just the birds were like, and all these different songs going off. I put on my binoculars, and I looked in, and it was like, bird, 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 bird. That's awesome. I was just like, oh, my God. That was amazing. Yeah. Oh, and uh, nettles. No, not nettles. It was a uh, nut hat, a nut hatch. Huh. Yeah, what was the hatch. first time I ever saw um, brown creeper? Oh, I love brown creepers. They're like upside down on the tree yeah, and like they, 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 scampering they, all over. They do little hoppies all around the tree. Like they oh, gravity doesn't work on them. No. It's amazing. so cool. They're so neat. Yeah, they do a um, a bird count at the zoo at like 7 in the morning every few months. That's and awesome. I got to go once as their uh, escort around the zoo since they need a zoo staff person with them. And I know very right. little about birding. And they were like, look over there, look over there, look over there. And I'm like, I work here every day. I didn't know we had all these birds here. What? <laughs> Wait, huh? What? Huh? That's awesome. Yeah, and I saw the creeper there for the first time. It was so cool. That's awesome. Yeah, so I got these really – Marshall got me these really awesome – image stabilization binoculars. So now instead of when I look far away and the the binoculars are like <laughs> vibrating all over the place as I'm trying to hold them steady and the, try to keep the bird in the center of the field of view. It's like, oh, okay, the bird flew away. I'm going to follow it. Trying to identify the bird that way. Now it's interesting. Now it's like, well, oh. how does it do that? So... I was told by Marshall today that it has to do with a, uh, there's a, a prism uh -huh. inside, and then there's also a gyroscope. Oh, and I was gonna say. so when you uh, shake uh -huh. in whatever dire direction, the gyroscope it takes note of that uh -huh. shaking, uh -huh. and then the prism is adjusted in the opposite direction. Right. That's so cool. Yeah, so if you shake this way, the prism goes that way, and the oh image my gosh. stays in the middle. That's amazing. And, and it does it like several thousand times per second. Jeez. Yeah. It's really awesome. interesting technology. Yeah. So you went bird watching, and then what else? I did. And I played at the playground with my child. That's good. Yeah, hung out a bit. It's been kind of a mellow day. I think there's going to be, it, you know, tonight was a Thursday, so not a lot. But I think, you know, little dinner tomorrow night. I don't know. Not a bad 28th birthday, huh? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to be 28. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> No problem. Anytime. Yeah, awesome. we're working on that. Well, I have something for you if we're ever in the same room again. <laughs> yeah. I have something for you from Ulysses. Okay. Yes. I think I know what it is. <laughs> I think you should. <laughs> okay. No, I will. In I think we're having a potluck tomorrow night, and I will invite you to come, but I need to tell you how to get here because you have not been to my house, and I'm not going to do it over this. Right. Well, um, if it's still going after 9.30, I might come by, but I have to work till 9.30 tomorrow. <laughs> Late night at the aquarium. Yes, I'm working the late shift tomorrow. Awesome. I'm learning how to close down the aquarium. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. That'll be great. Pretty sweet. Yeah. You have the keys. You have the codes. Yes. You know how to get in. Yeah. I like that. I won't be poking any fish. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to go poke the rays. Yeah. Okay. Well, the children do that all day. I know. They seem happy about it. Their little, their yeah. little behavior. Uh -huh. What's up there? Hey, hey, hey! I see you. I see you. I see, I see you. you. <laughs> Touch me. Touch me. Oh, Ben Rothig, thank you very much. Then Kiki would be younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing twists since I was twelve years old. Yeah. <laughs> 
Got an early start. That's yeah. right. Child prodigy. That's right. <laughs> Child podcast prodigy. I'm sure that actually exists now. There probably are 12 year olds with podcasts. Oh, yeah. Goodness. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. All right. I will send send you the note. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lovely. Okay. Yeah. All right. I really did want to talk about something in the after show, and I forgot what it was. <laughs> I'm really remembered. bummed out. <laughs> I have to write myself a note next time. I, it was during the show. I was like, ooh, I can't wait to talk about this in the after show. <laughs> you forgot. <laughs> Oh well, I do that. Like oh, you, well. you and Justin are going back and forth at each other, and I'm like, oh, oh, this point, I want to make this is an important way. We can just wrap it up and end it, and then I'm like, oh, and then it just goes away. <laughs> then I say something, and then Justin says something, and then I remember what I was going to say. I was like, okay, I can wrap it up again. I'm going to do this, and mm. oh, well. Oh, oh well. let's see what's going on this week tomorrow. Science chat. If I can, I don't have a babysitter, I don't think. But science chat, I think if I can do the child thing, that's fine. I'm gonna work on that. Mm -hmm. And Sunday night, I'm going to be doing a, a Discovery Shark Week hangout. Nice yeah. with Discovery. Yeah, that's awesome. It's gonna be awesome. I don't know who. I don't know exactly who's on it. Um, but yes. So speaking of Shark Week, it's Shark Week at the aquarium starting Saturday. So if you're in the Bay Area, you can come to the Aquarium of the Bay, and we have special programming every day for Shark Week. And you have sharks. And we have four types of sharks found in the bay that are native to the bay, and then we have two other species that come in and out of the bay, and one of them is the ones you can touch. And it's the coolest thing too. The aquarium you go through, and it's this, it's a tunnel, yes. and the sharks love the tunnel. swim around you and over you, and you're like, ha ah, ha, sharks. So cool. Yeah. What is it? The six, seven, seven, seven. guild, seven guild, seven guild. seven guild shark. That one is, that one looks nasty. <laughs> Although they mostly eat dead stuff, they kind of just go through like doo doo doo. <laughs> They look very nice unobtrusive, actually. I think when you like when you see them every day, you start to go, "You look like a softy." <laughs> 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 they the scuba divers go in there and they swim right next to them and they hand feed them. So apparently, it's not apparently normal. not as dangerous as mm -mm. you might think. Lots of sharks like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sharks. yeah. And then also I have. A new weekly pub quiz that I might as well plug for anyone in the Bay Area. Nice, yeah. So if you want to come do pub trivia with me as the host, it's at a bar called Neck of the Woods at 8.30 on Wednesdays. And we always have free pints to give away and prizes and what percentages or monies off of your tab or the first, second, uh, third place prizes. It's in the Richmond District. Cool. Yeah, it's on Clement and Fifth. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Good so area. Neck of the Woods, 8.30 yeah. Wednesdays. Yeah. Sweet. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Pub quizzy. Mm, Wednesday is often date night. We should, maybe I'll bring, bring Marshall. You should. Science pub quiz date night. <laughs> yes. I, there, I wish there was more and science blues. on there. And there's not as it's much science as I would like. I'm uh, I'm currently writing questions for them, and I'm trying to put as much science in there as possible. But the problem is they're they're very hesitant to put too much technical science in there because they think the average person might not know, oh, which is it. a problem. But um, I'm trying to make it more like middle school level science. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, the average person knows a lot more about Honey Boo Boo uh -huh. than and football. <laughs> science. I know. I will lose. I know nothing about football. Yeah, it's you twi know what? There's quiz twi qu questions, <laughs> questions related to sports. I'll be like, yeah, but they also have politics, what? and then they have theme rounds. Like uh, last week was called "Show Me the Money," so all the questions either had money in the answer or was relating to money, which was interesting. And then they had uh, 
they have a picture yeah. round always, so you have to write the name of the person or the thing or the animal or the place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not good at quizzes. I don't know. We, we might do it. Marshall will win. <laughs> I can say I'm on Marshall's team. Mm -hmm. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. All I guess right. that's it. I didn't remember the thing. I'll have to write it down, whatever it was. Write it down. Strengths, no, I'm not going to do a hangout from inside a tank. No. No. Uh -huh. I don't know how to scuba dive, so I don't think that would work very well. Otherwise, it would just be my feet hanging out inside the tank. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to get scuba certified really bad. I need to work on that. I was going to do it when I was in Israel before, but That'd then be I awesome. got the job, so I wanted to come back and get my job instead. Yes. <laughs> A little more get important. Your job, exactly. Keep it moving. Okay, it was awesome talking with you. Thanks for yeah, the dinosaur yeah. birthday hat. No problem. Here, I'll give it to you. Thank you. Ha. Ha. There you go. And I will message you, and then I will see you next week, or Great. maybe Friday. Maybe, if you're still going when I get off. Yeah, we probably. I don't okay. know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you so much for watching. Blair, thanks for having awesome news. I know you didn't, you didn't tell us the scary story, but that's okay. No, no. You guys and, can just guess. I don't need to be implanting any horrible yeah. things in anyone's mm. brains right before bedtime. No nightmares. I put it on then. Facebook before, so. I'll go look for it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Have a good one.